All right, King Killers, just want to give a quick uh, note on this episode. Fitz had some audio issues. His mic was recording from his computer instead of his microphone, so his audio is a little bit off. Um, didn't want to redo the episode. It's it's the only episode we have where there's any audio issues, so didn't want to redo the whole episode. There's too many things we talk about in that uh, we, we just wouldn't be able to recapture redoing it. But um, outside of that, there's no real issue on the episodes. A lot of a lot of good stuff that we talk about in it. Um, we also are dropping a YouTube video where we had a guest on, and that video is going to be out around the same time. I might try to get it out uh, with this episode, but uh, check out our YouTube page for that. It's a little bonus episode where we go through. Uh, I we had a guest on. He talked about a uh, post that he made on uh, Reddit that we found interesting. It's good conversation, so check that out. You can see the link to our YouTube page is in the uh, show notes. Check that out, and outside of that, uh, we'll get get on with the show. All right, King Killers. In this episode, we're covering chapters 18 through 23. You're going to learn about the absolute shithole that is Tarbian. We'll hear about what makes Tim's Tim Cry, the hidden slave trade in this world, and the darker side of butternut squash. Then we're going to dive deep into Periel's Poontang, and Fitz is going to tell the same lame joke three times. He loves it for whatever reason. I'm very confident that you guys are going to be with me and Tim and hate it. Uh, Then lastly, we return to our man, the great and almighty, powerful Gray Dalsenti, who is the man of mystery, I think we figured him out. So sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome back, you killers, to the seventh episode of the baddest and most killerous broadcast, King Killer Podcast. Tonight, I'm joined by my friends, Dimple Dong Dan and Pimple Schlong Tim, and I am long on fits. You guys doing good despite your genitalia defects? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean. Man, go that was a rough go, one for me. Go, go see the tall at the Stormwall Mountains or something. Get this stuff checked out. Yeah, that's what you got to do. Uh, I forgot you'd get them taken care of. But I, I don't... Pimples? I don't know. I, that sounds like uh, more of a dermatologist problem than... Uh, <laughs> girls like the girls like dimples. They, girls, girls always think dimples are cute. How do you get a dimple there? How's that? <laughs> you got like a recess? Like, <laughs> like you get... Get it caught in a stapler or something, get some dimples, some permanent dimples in it. Sounds painful. Something like that. <sighs> yeah, it does. This or you could wear one, one of those ribbed one of those ribbed condoms on inside out, maybe. Yeah, this is our, a rough our, uh, rough start. Uh, <laughs> really, really hampered me with the female audience members. <laughs> you'll you'll make up for it. You'll make up for it, I'm sure. Yeah. No, they'll like my personality. <laughs> Humility. They better. Oh, shit. Humility, too. You got that yeah. dimpled, dimpled Chad going on. <laughs> it's so cute. I, I, I well, mean, unlike... honestly, though, I'd rather have dimples than pimples on it. So, you know, I'll take, I'll the, take the craters. Clear up. Yeah. Well. Maybe maybe the dimples are from pimples. I'll fucking popping them. I'll Botox my shit and fucking straighten it all out. It's getting grosser. Scrotox. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just getting grosser. <laughs> Scrota. <Ugh. laughs> All right. Well, let's dive in, guys. Uh chapter 18 is titled Roads to Safe Places. And uh in this chapter, Kavoth discusses the four doors people use to escape painful memories. Then he dreams about different survival skills that uh he needed to survive in the woods, and a couple of them he never actually experienced in real life. Uh, then he awakes and goes about collecting food and water to survive. Guys? Yeah, so obviously, you know, the first part, we've we've talked a ton, you know, about this part. Now we're 
we're at this where you got the four doors that you use uh, to escape painful memories, sleep, forgetting, madness, death. And that's obviously important because one, I, I think Haley X, you know, he mentions in the, scor- the story Scarpy tells that he can't escape the four doors. He can't go to sleep. He can't forget. He can't go mad. He can't die. And also in chapter 16, when Haley Axe is talking with Cinder in the group, there's a couple parts where he mentions, like, put him behind the doors of sleep. And then it mentions, like, that he had a, uh, a painful look on his face from that. And there was another part where he, he mentioned, like, sleep or forgetting. And also, he, you know, he was, it sounded like it pained him to talk about it because he can't escape behind these doors. And it obviously plays a huge role in the coat versus Kvothe dynamic. Yeah, and it seems with uh, with Haleax, it seems to be, yeah, I mean, without us knowing more, it seems to be the main focal point of why he does what he does, right? Is the whole Lan Ray... Uh, what's her name? Lyra. Lyra. Damn. Uh, yeah, that whole dynamic he still hasn't gotten over that loss. At least, I mean, it seems to be stemmed. Uh, the reactions or the actions that have portrayed since seem to be stemmed in the fact that he can't use these doors. And it's it's cool how we get to see Kavoth move through them, right? I mean, in the coming chapters, it's it's very clear he's laying this out now at the beginning of of this chapter to then walk us sort of through those doors and then what's really cool is on rereads you realize i mean we that's what we've talked about the coat cloth dynamic is very much an illustration of of these doors and we what we don't know exactly what got him here but he's clearly stuck behind something uh whether it's the well i guess it's the door of forgetting right or madness yeah he i mean obviously him as coat is very similar to him as a kid in Tarbian. There's a lot of similarities. Mm-hmm. I think there's something more going on this time around with coat because he can't like it, it, when he's a kid, he doesn't even try to use sympathy or at least we don't see him try to use sympathy. Doesn't even seem to register with him to try. But as coat, he tries to use sympathy and he's not able to do it. Or he tries to fight like the Adem taught him, but he's not able to do it. There's something what? holding him back. He, or And also, like, he can't get into his chest. He can't open it. He can't figure yeah. out how to do it. Well, and like you said with uh, the changing of his name, I think there is a lot of significance in that. And I think one of the biggest things uh, that also uh, is playing out here is he's caused this for himself. So he's bearing this weight of guilt that's also holding him in this position where he's not able to do the things that he should be able to do. It's a lot worse in in some senses than what happens to him in Tarbine because that's happening to him. He didn't really cause it. It's not his fault. This where he's at now or where he's at in the beginning of the book, it's that seems to be his fault. He seems to have caused this through his decisions. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe caused well, we don't it, know. but he's we not don't deciding. Know, but... Yeah, we don't know, but he's not. I don't know that may, maybe it's just like Tarbian where something has has happened to him that, that brought him to being caught. That, do you think that makes more sense since we've seen it here? Not based on I think what it's a he mix. said. Not not based on what he said because he like tells Bast he's like this is all my fault. Uh, it yeah. could be like survivor yeah, right. s- survivor's guilt. He obviously has some survival survivor's guilt right now. Could be that, but I don't think so. I think he actually, uh, li- I think it's likely that he opened the doors of stone and unleashed uh, hell on the world. Uh, I-, I don't think he did it uh, intentionally to unleash hell on the world, but I think there's something, something happened where he felt he had to open those doors. Maybe it was to save Denna or something like that, but the consequences were far greater than, than he could have imagined. And I, I think that's more likely than something bad happened to him based on the way he talks to Bast about it. So um, can I throw out um, my theory right now? Yeah. It'd be my, it'll be my first theory. I haven't, haven't given, I haven't had one yet right. besides both maybe being an anti-hero, but uh, this, this plain faced lackless guy, I think he may be um, a bigger character than they lead on to. 
Like I think, you know, after we, everything we've talked about where with the, with the four doors of sleep, but, but in our, in our discussions, how Abenthe, the myste- mysteries of his character and also Chronicler maybe being part of the Emir or is it the Adem? No, it's the Emir, right? Hmm. Yeah. So maybe this uh, plain faced lackless guy is obviously, well, not obviously, but, but a part of the lackless fam- family and uh, the land Ray and both mom's family. And, and possibly this is, you know, maybe his like uh, great uncle lackless who is coming to teach him just what he needs to know right now so that he can survive for later on. It seems uh, interesting. It's interesting you mentioned that because this time reading through, I did feel like he's being delivered information. And it's very important that it's mentioned that he didn't know these things. He hadn't yeah. learned them before. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've had dreams before where I'm capable of doing things or I f- do things uh, or know things that I that I don't know. You know what I mean? So I've had that feeling before, but this is much more, I mean, this is very practical, right? I mean, this is a, it's very detailed. It's very specific to specific herbs and types of berries he can eat at certain times, certain times you can't, what this is going to do, uh, you know. How to find water? Like, yeah, I mean, it's very, pra- it's a lot of practical information, which there's a blur there because I feel like when I first read it, I felt like Lacklith was someone that he knew at some time when he was with the troop. That's right. He said they that. hadn't that. Yeah. So they had an experience and I, I thought this was part of the experience that he had had, but so there's, we don't know how much was in reality and how much uh, is unreality and, and it's being delivered through his dream. But said, I get the two, sorry, the, he says, go ahead. The, the two parts that he says that uh, he, he had never learned were, he was never taught sailor's knots from Ben, and uh, my father never finished his song. Uh, the part with Lacklith is memories. That's uh, mm. things that happened that he was taught as as a kid. And yes, I, I also think that Lacklith could very likely be a a Lackless, like a uh, a part of that family, a, a a broken line of that family. But yeah, I I don't think. That that dream is just a dream. I think that someone was feeding him the information he would need to survive. I think when someone came and scared the Chandra in a way, and he felt like someone was watching him, I think those same people that saved him from the mm. Chandrian also fed him the information that he needed to survive. But not only fed him information he needed to survive, but also gave him hints of things he would need to know in the future. That would be important because I think that the when they talk about the gray stones, he says, so then Ben was no longer there and there was not one standing stone, but many more than I had ever seen in one place before. They formed a double circle around me. One stone was set across the top of two others, forming a huge arc with thick shadow underneath. I reached out to touch it. This is similar to the description in Faye Reunion possibly the doors of stone and Faye Reno is described as there's a place not mo- uh, many folk have seen a strange place called Faye Reno. If you believe the stories, there are two things that make Faye Reno, Faye Reno unique. First, it is where all roads in the world meet. Second, it is not a place any man has ever found by searching. It is not a place you travel to. It is a place you pass through while on your way to somewhere else. So he walked to the, and then later on it. So he walked, through the center of Faerianul, and as he did, he saw a circle of great gray stones. I think the circle of great gray stones in that story of Skiop that Kaboth tells Will and Sam about the bum traveling through Faerianul and comes across the different groups, I think that circle of gray stones and the one he dreams about is the same. And if that's the case, he's never seen that. And it's highly likely someone was putting that into his mind for, you know, for information, embedding a memory into his mind for later. So this also kind of plays into, I don't know if it's a direct theory, but something we've talked about before where there, his, his bloodline seems to be 
his particular bloodline seems to be a, a nexus of Blacklist, Rue. There's some Fae in there, right? Like, and I don't know if Fae, but I mean, if he's he's connected he's through the story, yeah. If he's a descendant of Ajax, then Ajax is the one that created the Fae. I think the the Fae, like, I think you got you got the two groups, the people that went into the Fae. I think they became Fae cre- creatures through the years, through kind of like an evolution process. So I don't know if they were like they started as Fae. I don't think that's that's the case. But regardless, yeah. So he he's got some lineage to the guy that created the Fae, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. So that I mean, because because that again, that again ties into. I mean, it ties into a lot of things. It ties into this, the 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 possible use of Kaboth to accomplish tasks that they're looking to have accomplished. So they're progressing him along. They're somebody's looking out for him, or it's almost like he's fitting that fateful plan that we've sort of talked towards a little bit as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting. I wanted to mention something though about the doors that I noticed on this this read through that didn't jump out as me jump out at me as much before. When they mentioned the door of death, the final resort, nothing can hurt us after we are dead, or so we have been told. I didn't notice that or so we have been told uh before. Is there something more I should be reading into that? Because it just feels like Well Haley X Haley X can't escape behind that door. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's what it brings my mind towards is that Haley X can't die. So there is no escape for him. Well, so, well, so I guess maybe what that makes me question is that Kai capable for others. Is he the only one? Can someone else fit into a, a wedge that you know? Can that happen to go both? I, yeah, I think it could happen to. I, I mean, I if it could happen once, I think it could happen again. Yeah. So yeah, I I definitely think it could happen again. Also, the going on talking about like the. Two parts of that, the the couple parts of that dream, where it wasn't information that he had had before. Like you know, obviously the Lackleth stuff is, is learning how to survive, uh, but then you also have about Ben with the knots. What I think is kind of cool about it, it says knots are an interesting thing. Ben said as he worked, the knot will either be the strongest or the weakest part of the rope. It depends entirely on how one make how well one makes the binding. Because they talk about binding and binding is is tied up in magic so much, it makes me think of the written magic that Denna talks about. How she was she was when she was learning how magic works from Kavoth and Will and Sim in the bar, and she asked them, "Have you guys ever heard of a written magic where you you know write something down and you know it it makes it come true." Like runes, right? Not like runes. Uh, like I took a. They were like, no, it sounds like you know fairy tale magic. It sounds like something that doesn't exist. Uh, they not not like not like a sigildry, sigil something mm-hmm. different. Like just you know writing. I want to be happy. Like a spell. Yeah. Like, like a, yeah, exactly. But like a written spell, and you see her throughout the stories. She's tying you know knots in her hair. And she's always, you know, it's it's a consistent theme where um, she's tying knots in her hair. And then at one point, Kavoth sees the knot in her hair and he goes, beautiful. Because he reads it, it's a Yilish knot. And it spelled, the knot she tied mm. spelled beautiful. And then when she gets embarrassed and takes it out, and he is like, ah, I liked it, you know, how it was better. And she is like, yeah, it's kind of the point. And um, you're supposed to see it and think beautiful is basically what she's implying. So, but she she does this throughout the books, and that was just the one time where he realized the knots she's tying in her hair spell something. And so, I think she might discover a written form of magic, and I think Ben is describing maybe Yilish knots and a written form of magic in that part. And so maybe this the Yilish knots are going to play a, a bigger role. I, I you know, I think there's a reason why he's learning how to read Yilish knots. I think that they're going to play a bigger role 
might be something to do with the with the doors of stone and it could be that this part here is kind of implanting that seed for written magic into his mind similar as imprinting the the seed of the gray stones is preparing him for future events so this could be about the uh this could also be about the the lackless box right yeah the, yeah that's know, that yeah. yeah that's what i would think it would have to do with is how to open the lackless box is there's i think there's some kind of written like Yillish knots, a written form of magic on there that you have to be able to read to be able to open it. Well, I mean, I mean that does tie into naming, right? I mean, it's just it's written, but it's yeah, you know, names mean something, right? Words mean something. Certain names to certain things unlock certain certain things. Yeah, so it's just a different form, right? Yeah, for sure. I think it's definitely. Ma- I think it's a type of magic. I think that's what Ben is describing. I don't think it's sailors' knots. I think it's written form of magic in the form of knots in the form of yellish knots oh that's really interesting yeah, it's it funny because this last read through i noticed the binding thing but i didn't make that deeper of a connection but it's again one of these things that you know fitz talked about before and i think we all experience it especially on our first read through we're like i think there's something more here i'm gonna continue <laughs> maybe i'll come back to it you know but but i i remember i had that feeling on on this one where it's like Oh, binding. Because, I mean, it's it's so great because it's also, he's telling us in the subject matter of the book, words mean something. Words mean something. Everything he puts in this book means something. There's no throwaways, right? So we've said that a number of times. Yeah. And I'll, I'll bring it up. Like uh, uh, when we come across, when Dennett comes into the story and he notices the knots, I'll, I'll make sure to, uh, to bring it up because it, it happens a lot. And it's yeah, I didn't. I remember. On, I think one time. I remember her her doing the the knots in her hair that smells beautiful, but but really, I don't. I don't. I didn't notice it, or at least you know, hold it and remember that she does it often. So I'll be interested it, as that comes up. Yeah, and there, and even right after that, she goes and when he discovers that, and she gets embarrassed. Then she he's he's trying to ask her about it and and stuff and. She ties into her hair, stop talking, or don't talk to me. And then he immediately <laughs> shut up. So I think, and, and now you could interpret it one of two ways, because he goes like, he's like, well, I, even I could read that sign. But it could be that it was a magical thing, and he stopped talking because she wrote that in her hair. But in his mind, he thinks he stops because he was reading a sign. But it could have been just. It could have also been magic. So it's another one of those like scenes where control. it could be. Yeah, it could. It could be two different. Uh, seen two different ways. Hmm. Which happens a lot. There, uh, there's so many parts in this book that you can interpret so many different ways. That's that's really cool though because it gives us another layer uh, of sympathy, right? Or if you want to call it magic, it's another layer to how it how it can be used or how it's used in in different ways there's like that interconnectedness um that he weaves throughout how he how rothfuss creates this you know sympathetic bindings how the the magic how how it works it works in uh these varieties of different ways and it does it does seem to come back to naming or words so if if the knot she's tying in her hair actually say something they tie into a word and that's what it all falls back to, right? That's what the the sigildry is. That's what that's what all of it is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's obviously it's a different type of magic. I mean, there's not it's it's similar to sigildry, but still even even different. It's not like it's not in sigildry that you type, you know, you spell out yeah. "Don't talk to me," and then you put that on, you know, some iron piece of metal like the it's it's not the same it's it's different but it is written like sigildry it's a it's more like a cousin to sigildry is what it seems like i i remember the way that i felt about uh when i first read about sigildry and how the runes are utilized it felt like ma- mathematics it felt like you build a formula with particular with particular words and if you leave one thing out it dramatically changes everything yeah you include one other thing in then it they can work a completely different way. Yeah, it kind of seems like calculus with yeah. the different uh 
you know, the different signs and symbols and, you know, the, the different formula you got to go by, you know, to make everything work, but you got to, obviously you got to know what, what the different uh, symbols and words mean and, you know, how to interpret them, put them together. So it seems like a, a type of formula that you got to put together, like in, in mathematics for civilry. And, but the Yilish knots thing does not seem like that at all. It just seems like you just straightforward, write what you want to happen. And then it happens. If, if that's actually what's going on. Is there anywhere else that the, um, that that's brought up besides with her? I don't think so. Not off the top of my head. I can't remember a spot where um, they talk about written magic. It's only that she mentions it and the knots she ties in her hair and that kind of stuff. And then also like he feels that box, the lackless box, he can feel what to him feels like yellish knots in, in that box that is just super worn away. So those are really like the only parts I can think of off the top of my head where that that kind of stuff is uh, discussed. Okay. Part of what uh, part of what I was thinking about this chapter and kind of the set of these two that I like a lot that Rothfuss does is he's he's emphasizing the change of mindset in Kvoth, where now the way he sees the wilderness is completely different. Like if something was scenic before, like oh that could be beautiful. Now it's just. Is that going to act as shelter for me? and Or is the undergrowth a source of nourishment? One of the things he says. And then like, you know, running water just it symbolizes his thirst rather than being what it would have been to him, you know, when he, when he wasn't alone in the woods trying to survive. Yeah, everything yeah, is duller. Something else, too, that he mentions along those same lines, as he says, specifically, I was, and I can't remember if it was this chapter or the, the next one, but he says, I'm not, I wasn't the person that I was, you know, a couple of weeks ago prior to his family. He, I, I just thought it was, was interesting because not only does he not recognize the, the way stones and, and, you know, the water for what it is, but he says specifically, I'm not, I wasn't the same person at all. Yeah, that's right. This is the beginning of the next chapter, but yeah, he, um, yeah, he, in this chapter, he mentions like, a good portion of my mind simply stopped working, went to sleep, if you will. But yeah, one of the parts I would do want to bring up about the Greystone being there again is, uh, you know, I've touched on it, but I think that the fact that the Greystones are so close by in the parts where we run into the Chandrian, like there's, there's this part, there's the part in Trayvon, and then there's the part where he fights uh, Cinder when he's with Tempe and Martin and all them. Um, there's a gray stone either very close by or relatively close by. And I think that maybe the Chandrian travel through gray stones. That's how they're able to kind of appear like lightning from the sky. I think that they m maybe dip out through these portals. Yeah, it does seem, uh, I mean, we, we've touched on that a number of times where it also seems to be a way to get to the Fey as well. It seems to be that portal to move to between worlds. I don't I don't see it at very clearly yet. I think it might become clear as I sort of we continue through. And maybe maybe book three can make yeah. this a little bit clearer for us. But uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. I mean, because it's it, it's 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 good to have things not be 100% clear cut in everything that we see because there is more mis mystery to it and it you know it it our obviously our world doesn't work in that way at least as far as we know right so uh so yeah i i kind of i kind of like that that feeling of it um and that does seem to be at least shown to us again we don't get a lot of glimpses of how the chandrian move it's just these events that we have to make connections ourselves Right. Yeah. So it's what, what you're talking about is those three events. Then we see these things happening those three times. I'll have to keep a, a, an open eye for the gray stone stuff a little bit more uh, myself. But yeah, I, I, I see the connection you're making for sure. I think uh, that probably covers it for 18, unless you guys got any last, last thoughts you guys want to bring up on it. No, I'm I'm ready for 19 if you guys are. 
I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. All right, then. Uh, chapter 19 is titled Fingers and Strings. Kavoth in this chapter begins to play his lute. He plays all the songs he can remember, and then he even starts to invent his own songs. Eventually, he breaks a string, and then he learns to play with six strings. Once he breaks too many strings to be able to continue playing, he heads out looking for a town in order to buy some. He happens upon a farmer who takes him to Tarbee. Guys? Yeah, and so this is where you get that part you were talking about, Fitz, where he's like, make no mistake, I was not myself. At least I was not the same person I had been a uh, span of days before. Everything I did, I attended with my whole mind, leaving no part of me free from remembering. And I and I, I don't take that as... I, I take that as literal, that he's, yeah. he literally was not himself. That I like he he was literally a different person because of locking himself behind the doors of forgetting. Well, and he stresses it in the next sentence where he even says, you know, he looks or in the next couple of sentences where he looks at rain, sun, grass, earth, stones with an intensity of indifference that only grief can promote. So, I mean, intensity of indifference, that's <laughs> that's that's really pushing that 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 feeling to the to the edge. So yeah, it's definitely it's there's there's an intent, but then again, he laid the groundwork before with those four doors. It's a pretty good writer, this guy, right? He, yeah, he's pretty good. He's pretty yeah. decent at this. <laughs> Where you you we already have that connection to make, and uh, and now we see it even clearer. Yeah, with, uh, with, it's great. Without these two chapters, eighteen and nineteen, coat at the bar, it doesn't make any sense. It's only when you come across these chapters and you learn about the four doors of forgetting, hmm. uh, uh, the four doors for the mind to escape, and him literally saying, "I was not myself. I, had, you know, my mind had went to sleep." And like his, none of that, none of coat makes any sense until you put it together with how he acts in Tarbian. Then when you see him as a kid acting in Tarbian, then all of a sudden it makes sense that oh, okay. So he did something's up with him. It's not an act. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense if it's just an act. But now you kind of figure out like, okay, it's something along these lines that is is going on. Something along along the same lines that's affecting Haliax and affected him as a kid in Tarbine. Something about these four doors and maybe something to do with changing his name or something like that or he broke his alar, or something like that is affecting him now. Well, the the other thing, uh, one of my biggest takeaways from this chapter as well, is his level of musicianship is very much articulated here because he's going to a level that... It's not just this guy's good at playing songs. This guy is creating music in a way that you don't hear about other people trying to create music. They're trying to play songs that sound like other songs they've heard, or at least that's that's kind of the way I I in, interpret it. And yeah, no, I where, agree. Like I, when he played uh, watching uh, Sandy dance, I and mean, that's clearly I'm in love with a stripper. <laughs> I mean, you can clearly hear that in your mind. I was thinking Crystal milkshake. Clear. Yeah, I was thinking the yeah. milkshake. Yeah. Oh, it's. I mean, yeah, it's interpretive, but you can clearly hear the song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean it gives uh it's definitely well and, and dude i mean so much so much happens here where now we can buy and it's all built in string breaks with dickhead ambrose why can he keep playing it's because of what we've read in this chapter not that he wouldn't be able to do it anyway but we immediately can make that connection all the way back to this chapter when we're reading then i, and, I don't uh, i don't think he would have been able to do it had it had this not happened I mean, because when it happens here, he just sits in a fucking stupor, and, like, when oh, it yeah. happened there, like, everybody was blown away, like, uh, his buddy, uh, the, the guy, the guy that wants to get him a patron, I'm drawing a Threp. blank at his name, Threp, Threp, yeah, Threp is, uh, he's like, he's like, oh, and I saw you start to try to play it again, and I thought, oh, boy, he, j he doesn't understand you know, my poor boy doesn't understand that he can't play with six strings. And he was like, but then you did. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, I, I think it's pretty clear. Had he had this not happened, 
he wouldn't have been able to do it because no one well, would be able to do it other than him in that situation. And, and there's a further emphasis, emphasis as well because it's not just that he attempts playing when turning a leaf. He spent three days yeah. trying to capture that sound. And I think he even goes, he even says... You know, I was I was a harsh audience. He's only playing for himself, but he's a harsh audience. He, we already know he has a high standard because he's listened to one of the greatest musicians alive and his father, because that's already been sort of articulated in past chapters. And we already have this respect built for the Rue and how all of them are, are great performers. So then to be in this, it's so interesting because he's 100% focused at this point because he's not looking at anything else. It's just survival and his biggest way to survive. I mean, this, this makes him go interact with the world because he lost his string. So now he has to, for all we know, he would have just stayed in the woods forever. Yeah. Right. I mean, cause it, he, he didn't want to leave until, until the strings broke and it had to be two. Right. So yeah. Or three. I, is it, two, I, is it seven or is uh, it eight, he, once, seven? Once seven. He, get, he plays, it starts with seven. He plays with six, he plays with five. Once he gets three strings mm-hmm. break down to four, he couldn't play with. I also think he was, uh, uh, more than just playing those songs. When, when he gets past the songs, like they, they make a dis- distinction. Once I played all the songs I knew, and then I played all the songs I half remembered, He's mm-hmm. like, then I started doing something other than playing songs. He's like, then I, you know, started playing things. I think at that point he was naming. I don't think he was just playing music. I think through music, he was learning how to name. I think the fact that he was behind, kind of had locked his, uh, his, his conscious mind behind doors. I think his sleeping mind was kind of running the show. And I think through like, playing a, a leaf turns and you know a, a, the the different things like that i think um that he was naming that's i hadn't thought about it that way that's really but interesting there's, there's something to that though because um i don't know going back to what haven't he said to both parents about him you know no matter what he does he's going to excel at and be the greatest when you get a look at when i remember reading this for the first time and and thinking this is an example of, of that, what Abenthe said, that he's playing like no one else has played before and doing things that no one else has done before. But obviously you don't think of it in that way that he's learned how to name, but that makes sense. Yeah, because the way they describe it, he says, I began to play something other than songs. When the sun warms the grass and the breeze cools you, it feels a certain way. I would play until I got the feeling right. I would play until it sounded like warm grass and cool breeze. I I don't think he was just playing songs at that point. I mean, there's there's no clarity to it, but I think that his his sleeping mind was kind of running the show, and that he was he was actually doing at least a form of naming. Being a fan of music, it's kind of actually great to picture in your mind what wind turning a leaf would sound like. Yeah, at least for me, like just like picturing what that would be. I, I don't know what it is, obviously, uh, but it's a it's a cool. I mean, again, Rothfuss picked something that we can all picture in our minds. We've seen it a million times, but it has a gentle, you know, oh, what is that movie? Uh, Beautiful Mind, where the dude records leaves just spinning around. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't know. It kind of the kinda plastic ties bag. In oh yeah, that's what it is. Plastic yeah. bag. Yeah, but you you also see it too, like. When he's when he borrows the uh, guy's loot when he first meets Denna and he's riding to the university and he borrows that guy's loot to play, he he doesn't play like a specific song. It's not like they said, oh, and then I played the say uh, uh the lay of Sir Travian Tra- Traillard or whatever it's called, the lay of Sir Savian Traillard. Um, he's like he doesn't say he played a specific song. He just started playing, and mm-hmm. everybody was mesmerized by the song they were completely wrapped up in this and so and then like denna started bawling as soon as he was, he was done i think like there's something to like him his music i think it, it it comes into play um as far as his naming i think there's something to 
his musical ability, uh, uh, that sleeping mind thing, his ability to just start playing and just let the music take him. I think it also is similar to uh, the what it takes to be good at naming. I'm thinking maybe Pat Metheny or what Wes Montgomery maybe, or Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. I'm just naming guitar players. All right. Well, I only and knew one of those. What, what's his style? Well, I knew you wouldn't know the first two, but they name the first two because they're jazz musicians, and so that's kind of the way I pictured it. I mean, I, I'm I'm only half joking. When when he does play that, that's a good example that you that you selected there, where he's with those strangers at the campfire, and he and he just plays, and they articulate that, or Brothfuss does, where he just kind of plays how he feels, and kind of what I pictured because it's not a song I pictured it as like jazz but yeah there's obviously more to it because people don't listen to us I mean some people that are super soft at the end of a song start start crying but uh you know I, I don't I've never been tight you know moved to tears personally uh from a song maybe I'm maybe I'm missing out no but, that's uh, a that's a complete lie for the audience I've seen Tim cry like <laughs> <laughs> At least thirty-seven times from listening to music. He yeah, is, every, when he listens to music, he do, he cries more than he's listening. Like handsome. he does one, he does one of those like things where he doesn't think we realize he's crying. We go, like, <laughs> you know, it's like I just, you know, the song's kind of good. It's it's just, it's all right, you know, it's not that big a deal. Uh, dude, Mbop is is not that shouldn't be that does that to everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mbop is nobody can listen to Hanson and not get weepy, dude. Yeah, when I hear like the uh, delay is Sir Saving Trailer Yard, I think of Mbop, <laughs> or at least like yeah. that, or a Spice Girls song. Well, I yeah, mean, we're talking top, you know, upper echelon here. So yeah, I mean, those are those are good comparisons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the the only other. Part, oh, well, I would also mention this. When he said, like, uh, after he'd stopped playing and he broke the strings, he said, I tried humming, snow falling with the late autumn leaves, callous fingers, and a lute with four strings, but it wasn't the same as playing it. I think that's also kind of a callback to the, when he was doing it with the music that was naming, when he tried humming it, it just wasn't the same thing. But the only other point I would uh, make on it is just kind of a... Uh, to give you a time scale of how long he was in the woods, his parents were killed in the spring. And mm-hmm. then when he left, he said, the weather helped uh, me make up my mind. Cool autumn was turning to winter's chill. So he stayed through pretty much summer and fall by himself in the woods. Like he was there for almost half a year. It's like six to eight months, something in there. Well, their, their year is... Um, a month is four span, which is 44 days, and a year is eight months, plus they got their seven, plus seven days uh, for their winter festival or whatever it's called. Winter pageantry is like seven days, so their year is three, like 359 days, so half half a year would be four months, but yeah. Um, the, only, the, the other thing that, that I would mention, we do see further how he's become more disconnected when he's walking down the road. He's basically hiding from people. Like first he just walks. He hadn't been around anybody forever. He sees somebody and he thinks he has to hide from these people. And then he starts to realize like they're not even paying attention to him. So he feels better about it. So then he just kind of, kind of keeps walking until uh, the guy with his, with his son, uh, you know, try to help him and then take him into the city. But I don't know. That's, that's kind of the, one of the other uh, things that, I thought was a nice touch uh, to further emphasize his disconnectedness, you know? Yeah, he, um, he he's definitely messed up. I mean, he's, he's terrified of just even the sight of other people. Yeah, he's, he's scared he's as shit. He can't even... Messed up. He won't even go uh, near an inn when he doesn't have water. He won't... There's you know, He passes all these taverns and everything else and he stays way away. He hides in bushes when a when people come by in carriages, like no threat at all, yeah, he's scared as shit. Yeah, he's like real thin. I mean, he's. I mean, it's it and it's it, it all sense. follows logically. Yeah, I was gonna you say it. See, it all makes sense. Yeah. See your whole everybody you known got murdered, and then you go and spend half a year in the woods by yourself trying to survive. 
Yeah, yeah, it's going to be rough trying to uh, reintegrate into society again. He's like Nell at this point. Yeah. Remember Nell? Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was no, going to go to check. A stupid point. joke. All right, go ahead. He, all you got to do is say, I was going to make a joke. We already know they're going to be. <laughs> got him. Okay, then. Uh, chapter 20 is called Bloody Hands into Stinging Fists. Both makes it into Tarbian, and on his way to find loot strings, he gets lost and gets jumped by Pike and his gang. They end up beating him, and in the struggle, his father's loot is destroyed. When he goes back looking for the farmer who brought him into town, he finds they've already left and ends up his first night in Tarbine sleeping on the street. Guys. Yeah, the, I, I don't have a, a ton of things to say about this chapter. Um, other than, like, the first thing I would say is when he backs away from that, that guy, I got two things to say on that. Like, when he when he's backing away, one he says like he knew that if he went with them, he would have to tell what happened, and he was willing to leave a situation where he could have went with them and had some semblance of a family and a life again. He was willing to run away with that to avoid the story. So that goes back to the fact that he just told. Bast and Chronicler this story and Chronicler is writing this story about his parents being killed by the Chandrian. He's writing this down for the whole world to be able to read. And it shows you how far he's come from how unwilling he has always been to tell this story to now he's willing to tell the entire world what happened to him. So I, I think that you know, gives you an idea. It reiterates the point which we made previously that I think he eventually tells his secret that he's been holding just deep down that he's just not been willing to to break through. I don't think that this was the first time he told his secret. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to, to bring up real quick is I like to imagine that the father and son, they kidnap little kids and then they <laughs> make them little slaves on their farm and that Kavoth thinks he screwed up by not going with them, but by not going with them, he saved himself of a dreary existence where he would have died as a slave. So that's that's one little bright spot. So as bad as Tarbian is, it was going to be way worse if he went with them. So if you ever if you ever read that and you felt bad, and you're like, oh man, I wish he would have went with them, just realize it's hidden deep. Little, it's little hidden slaves. deep. That was a slave trader. Huh. Wow, you're probably right, Dan. Yeah, no, I'm 100 percent right. It's clear. Rob it's in the text. Could probably readdress that in, in book three. I bet. Oh, I'll 100 percent confirm that I'm right. Mm -hmm. That guy's a slave trader. He's a piece of shit, and you thought he was a good guy, and you were dead wrong. Wow. Um, I was actually going to say I like that he went from what was a kind of heartening uh, thing to find <laughs> that there are actually good people in the world that are willing to help. Uh, Kavoth, who you know we're rooting for, and then immediately after, immediately after he meets savagery and just fucking awful, awful situation to be in, and uh, so we get that dichotomy. Just bam, it's it's very uh very abrupt. But there was a a bit of a what I think is a jewel on uh before Pike, where he talks about um after you know his whole family was murdered. There's times where he would wake up. And, you know, he would wake up from his dream and he would forget that his whole family's dead. He would think it's all just a bad dream. You know, if you ever, you know, have a dream about like a dog you had when you were a kid or something, you wake up and then, and then you remember, oh shit, they are all dead. So, he, I mean, to, so he's got like three paragraphs where he sort of explains how he's had to adjust to that, that existence. And then that leads into bam. And it's kind of in the middle of when. Actually, that's sorry. That's right after the loot broke. Yeah. So he's in the midst of getting his ass kicked, and then we get that little picture of, you know, how his life has changed. How it, it, he's even getting into the mind of how that situation would change for an individual who wakes up, and then has to re remember that he's lost everything, and then he gets to get his ass kicked a little bit more. So it's pretty intense. Pretty intense scene there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a rough scene for old uh, little little baby Koth. 
and not only that, but uh, then they crush that. Well, I think he kind of does it. Both himself actually crushes his dad's loot, but so begins his hatred for Pike. Yeah, yeah, he ends up one. he he ends up on top of. So it was already it was already getting damaged, and actually, just the loot coming out is what got him to fight. But he has no chance, and then he ends up on top of it, if I remember right. And as he's yeah, he tries checked. to steal it. He try or not steal it. He tries to take it back from uh, Pike, and then. All he ends up doing is pulls Pike to his feet, and then Pike yeah. beats the shit at him. It eventually gets broke on the ground, and Pike fucking kicks him into it, splinters it even more, and then proceeds to just pummel the shit out of him. And it's a, uh, it's a brutal scene for him. Yeah, um, it's brutal. Go I ahead, was just going to say when, when what Fitz was saying, it's not just some random guy. It's a it's like a city watch, it's like a cop. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, the guy that saves saves him. He's a, he's also a piece of shit. Well. Yeah, <laughs> was he? I yeah, the, didn't realize the, he was a cop. The, the fact that he was like, you know, this is all I get, and you know, fucking, he's robbing this little kid, twelve year old boy, who's just had the shit kicked out of him, and he's just picking his pockets. Like, the only reason I came is because you sounded like a girl. It's like, what the fuck are you gonna do to the girl? Yeah, Jesus, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, I just saved your life, little lady. <laughs> Guess what, what you, you get to do? Yeah, what do you got for me? Yeah, it's pretty brutal. But again, make, that just make, make me some dinner and clean my house. Yeah, I think he was going to do a lot worse than that. Oh, <laughs> that's my mind doesn't go there. I, yeah, I was thinking, you know, dishes <laughs> and the laundry. Oh Jesus! Uh, uh, but this is uh, what what we're covering here. I, I I really like the writing, the gradual transition of like preparing us for what ends up just being a living hell for a kid. Who's just lost everything, and then now he's getting into survival mode, and then he's forced to move into this world, and now it's like, it's way worse. It was way worse than what it was when he was in the woods by himself. Yeah, it, yeah it's immediately, it's brutal, and that's not even close to the worst of it. Like, that was just his first first day, and like then when he gets shit kicked out of him, he goes and looks for the, the uh, slave traders that he thought were going to save him. When he comes back, they're thankfully, they're gone. So he didn't get put into bondage to work on <laughs> that guy's farm. So thankfully, well, they trip. yeah yeah no they hundred percent are, and so thankfully he was saved from that dreary hellhole of a life. But he goes and like tries to curl up on some shopkeeper's porch and you know gets kicked out of there and then just goes and you know sleeps in an alley and, you know buying some barrels for the night and that's his first night in tra- uh, Tarbian. He lost most of Pretty, his belongings. Pretty fucking sweet opening to uh, Tarbian. Get you ready sure. for what's to come because it's pretty fucking brutal. You ever had a good butternut squash, Dan? Because um, nobody who who has butternut makes butternut squash. They, no way they could be slave traders. Every slave trader lures little kids in with butternut squash. Is that how they do it? Yeah, that's huh. that's a known thing in uh, in history. It's very famous in, uh, in history. In, yeah, it's very famous it's no in, in history. Roman history <laughs> that slave traders used butternut squash. Is that like the Pied Piper? He he really wasn't playing a flute. He was just a uh, you know giving handing out squash. Yeah, he just dragged butter uh, buttered up squash behind him, and that's how he lured everybody in. Huh. So it's just like a historical set. historical facts that I'm dropping on everybody. Okay, so if you see like a symbol of butternut squash, you know it's a symbol of slave trade. Yes. Okay. Hundred percent. Okay. Well. Okay. We all yeah. learned something, right? Yeah. So. Well, we're getting off topic here. You guys want to move on to the next chapter? This is the most important thing we've covered. The <laughs> other, the yeah, there's a, there's a couple minor minor things I wanted to bring up. Uh, one one little. Part of it I like is it's not even uh, it's another one where uh, Rothfuss just layers something in, but he doesn't explain it, and it's just something that gives more character to the world. Like when Pike is is roughing him up, he's like, uh, "What are you doing here, Nolt?" Keeps calling him Nolt. Well, the first time you're going through this, you have no idea what the fuck's Nolt. Like you know it's an insult, but you don't know what the insult is 
then you learn that Nalt is referring to uh, Emperor Nalto. That's the guy that uh, Master Lauren asks him why did what what was the cause of the breakup of the Aeturn Empire, and Kavoth talks about that uh, Emperor Nalto was an inept egomaniac and blah 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 i don't know if you guys remember this was when he Hmm. he first got to the university and he was doing his first little uh run through the of the questions they asked that was one of the questions that master lauren asked him was uh who uh what was the cause of the downfall of the Aeturn empire and uh emperor nalto was the guy in charge and so emperor nalto now like he's fallen so so low in terms of how society views him that people use the term "nalt" as an insult. Uh, on that same vein, and I've mentioned this before, um, and actually it's in the same section where one of the kids in the group keeps saying, "Don't say Taylor's name like that." Basically, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And uh, yeah, again, sort of world building it. Because we don't know who, I don't think we know who Taylor is at this point. We've heard it mentioned a couple times, uh, just as like it, the same way people say like Jesus Christ or you know uh, when they're taking the Lord's name in vain, right? So it gets very much emphasized here by the kid, and even says, "Oh, now like once the uh, once the loot breaks, he's like, see what happened? You should, I told you, and don't take the you know the Lord's name in vain, and look what happened to you." Yeah, so. exactly. Do not call on Taylor saving the greatest need for Taylor judges every thought and deed. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely that made me think of when you brought up like you think it, the sharp word not for swearing might be uh, in reference to Taylor. I, I think that I'm more and more coming around to that idea that the sharp sharp word not for swearing might be Taylor's name. And there's so one like part where, yeah. His real name, not his Taylor, but the yes. real name. Yeah. Yes, yes, his real name. There's one part that's going to come up in, in a couple chapters where I think it kind of solidifies that. But I think sharp word not for swearing might be Taylor's, Taylor's real name. The only other part that I was going to bring up in this chapter is just I thought it was funny was when the, the kid called the religious kids Mama Whore, and then it talks goes back to Pike and Kvothe fighting, and then it comes back and it's just... You just catch the end of this kid talking and it was, uh, but she kept humping away anyway, but now she only got, got a half penny a throw. That's why your head is so soft. You're lucky you don't have a dent. So, you, so don't feel bad. That's why you get religious so easy. Such a great fucking insult. Yeah, he, he, yeah, it's funny. I was listening to that part today and it was like, yeah, he kept going. Cause before that, he's like, he called like he's a don't talk about her. He kind of stops. Then he's like, oh, by the way, penny she's a pe- she's a, yeah she's a penny whore, iron pennies, and he keeps yeah. pushing it. And then we then another two paragraphs, and then then what you said. So he just keeps yeah keeps going. Yeah. This dude is he's brutal, been man. layering in these insults. <laughs> yeah, this dude is yeah he's he's a uh, Pike is brutal kid man. He should have been a stand up comedian. Instead, he's a <laughs> you know a little fucking bum on the street. He had a he had a uh, he had a ready-made job yeah promising career ready-made those streets are rough yeah (laughs) but i I don't really have any anything other on that chapter i don't have any anything else that i was going to comment on i think that pretty much covers it for me Uh, yeah yeah. that's it for me too yeah but yeah that that's the beginning of the only thing that i wanted to add i already did and that's uh his introduction to tarbian is Pike's game, yeah, for his next three well, years. So. And then what's what's actually also interesting. I just wanted to mention it because of what will happen in the next chapter. It's just at the beginning of the next chapter, but it's tying into what what we're reading now. Is he just starts to acclimate? You know, like he starts to acclimate to even this world. Like he is. I mean, he is a survivor. Um, he figures these things out as bad as it is. But um, yeah, it's just like he just takes to begging. And starts to realize how it works. And, you know, it's just, he just, it sucks. Even the way he talks about it, it's not like he's having a good time, but it's almost like he's got a little bit of a sense of humor about it. And he just, he he adapts, you know, but I mean, he, we're rushed in here uh, with the whole Pike situation. And, um, but yeah, it's. Welcome to Tarbian. Yeah, it's quite a transition. 
Okay, then chapter 21 is titled Basement, Bread, and Bucket. A month has passed and Kavoth has been begging in the streets to survive. He ends up following a couple of the other homeless boys into a basement where he discovers Trappist, who spends his time caring for the orphan children of Tarbian. Yeah, and it, this uh, it's a real short chapter. There's not, not a lot that happens. happens. It's more just kind of introducing Trappist to the... Um, Trappers to the story, but you also you also get the uh, he mentions the Talon priests, so it's just kind of kind of setting up the next few chapters. Get the introduction of Talon priests, and obviously you get the uh, little part where you know he doesn't want to um, when they offer to take him inside. He's like, yeah, no, I'm good on that, buddy. Yeah, because he gotta, says he's heard stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th- I think I'm good on that that one i'm gonna i don't need to bread that bad i thought there were two uh two kind of revealing things that uh jumped out at me the duke of gabea gabia i would say duke of gibia but i gibia. think they might say uh gibia or gabea i don't remember how they say i say gibia he it's not uh su- super vital but it, he does explain it's just some guy that you know him and his people tortured it was basically he walked in heard these sounds thought it was a torture chamber what I thought was interesting about that is it speaks to Kavos, wh- where he's at in his mind, his mind state. I mean, he's me- entered like he's paranoid. Anything that's around him, he's thinking worst thing, worst case scenario first, which that's survival mode. So, um, and, you know, we didn't mention this in the last chapter, and obviously we'll get into it more as he's in Tarbine, but he refers back to his time in Tarbine the rest of his life because he's like, when I was in Tarbine, this never would have happened to me. Because I was always ready. I was always on the defensive. I yeah. was always looking around the corner. I was always expecting something. And as he starts to relax further and further and further and get into, you know, a normal existence, um, he lets his guard down. And he never... Yeah, he becomes he, like a normal person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when he's in Tarbian, it's it's almost like... So he, he's got like... I don't know. It's not really a nostalgia, but it's almost like he has an admiration for what he became in learning how to survive when he was in Tarbian. Yeah, he appreciates the skills that he, you know, as bad as Tarbian was, he's he's smart enough to realize that not everything about Tarbian was a negative. There is some positive things that that came of that, even if they were they were terrible, terrible things were happening to him because those terrible things were happening to him. Positive things came like that. He. He's very cognizant of his surroundings. It's very hard to ambush him. And he learned how to, you know, cut purses. He could pick lock and, you know, yeah. he can unlock any door. He learned all these skills. Like he, he gained, even in the worst environment with all kinds of shit, he didn't just like, oh, woe is me. He made the best of it, and he's taken the skills that he learned in that situation with him for the rest of his life. Well, because he's still he's still him. He's still a sponge. I mean, he still soaks up experience and and becomes the better for it. Um, we've seen that every situation he's in. I mean, and this is what uh, Abanthi saw in him. It's why it's you know it's a big part of the reason why he's talking about his he's going to be a huge you know, influencer, you know, he's going to be acclaimed at whatever he does because he, he's that able. And, you know, the other thing I was thinking about is for being a, you know, kind of a street rat kid, he, he finds the, the best place that you could possibly hope for to sleep and like to call his own. It's like a shelter with, with heat next to a chimney. I don't know. A little bit of shelter. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't know if it speaks to, you know, quote being a genius, but. I, well, I, I was always like, you know, you're there for three years. No one else fucking yeah. popped on this spot by a chimney. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's surprising. So part of it. Yeah. I, I, I just kind of see it the way you were saying fits that uh, somebody that's as smart as he is. He, he adapts and uh, he's smart uh, at what he found. But yeah, at the same time, it is kind of like nobody else ever came across this. Like everybody, like it, se- it seems of, a little bit hard to believe, but. Bunch of dum dums. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, like, so the, the uh, Kavoth's uh, like, man, that <laughs> chimney, that chimney is pretty fucking sweet in winter. Everybody else just <laughs> sleeping out in the fucking cold like a bunch of morons. 
<laughs> well, I'm yeah. looking for fucking chimney roofs. It, it sounded like Pike's, uh, like Pike's setup. It's, it's you know, it's like what you see under under pa- under overpasses out here. It's just something like they had, they had boxes yeah. under uh, Kahunga, the <laughs> yeah, Kahunga yeah, underpass. Kahunga. Uh, the other part of the chapter uh, that I thought was really cool was he immediately, very quickly, he sees uh, trap his feet and he immediately starts diagnosing what he sees. Oh, so yeah, that's that, interesting. So that part, it's still there. He still accesses these things. He still has these skills. I, I really liked it. It like jumped out because he not only does he he diagnose or does he uh, he diagnoses what the problem is, but he's also like, this is what should be done. This is what you do to treat that problem. Elevate yeah, and the it was feet very put put some salve on it or whatever. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it was it was very uh robotic where it wasn't like he was consciously thinking of this. It was just like stuff that's in the back of his mind that he still has access to. Cuz obviously once he once he flips the light switch back on, he has access to all of his fucking former knowledge. But in that moment it was more like he wasn't really you know, looking for that information, it was just like a spark of light flicked on where it was just like, like a little robot fucking turning on where he just spurted out like what would need to be done and then just immediately turn that shit back off. Well, and speaking to that, I mean, he even calls himself at the beginning of the 19, he calls himself, it was almost like an automaton thoughtlessly performing actions that would keep him alive so i mean he even, yeah you know he that's a very very clear connection to the doors right of of where he's at he's just he's going through the motions yeah then the one of the other parts i'd bring is like the the duke of uh gibia obviously is that's your first mention of him he does it really well throughout the books is like he just sprinkles sprinkles the guy's name out there the duke of gibia or he mentions puppet a couple times in the first book and you don't meet meet puppet until the second book duke of gibia you don't really find out you know the full story on the duke of gibia until later on Mm -hmm. but they're they're big figures like duke of gibia is is reading one of his books is where he comes up with the idea that the emir didn't actually disband they just went into hiding because he read on like the insides of one of his books, it had like the uh, saying of the Emir. I can't remember what the saying is, but like a main saying, like you know, for the greater good, basically. And he read that like on the outsides, written in a uh, different language, and that's where he came up with the idea that he expressed to Sim that maybe they, when the Emir was uh, disbanded, that they didn't just close up shop and stop they just went underground. Hmm. So that's Gibia is reading one of Gibia's books is where he came up with that idea. And, you know, this is your first obvious mention of him. So, but he, he does a really good job of slowly, but surely making you familiar with a name, make you kind of familiar with a person so that when he starts really bringing them to life, you know, you're a little bit familiar with them, even if well, it's just in the back of your mind. It's also, I mean, it's it's important for the world building too, for us, but it's also the reputation. So if if Kavoth at this age knows who the Duke of Gibeah is, yeah, he's well read for his age, but that's saying a lot about the Duke of Gibeah, yeah. right? Same thing yeah. about uh, you know any any of these other names that we come across. You know, they're they're mentioned for a reason. People know them for a reason. And so they, they've accomplished something or they have some sort of notoriety or in the case of Duke of Gibeah here, it's, uh, it's infamy, right? It's, it's a negative. And that, oh, yeah. that happens yeah. quite a few times with, well, and like you said, with, uh, what does he call him? Uh, Nar- uh, Nar- Nalt? Nalta. Yeah. So Nalt, that would also be, you know, an infamous type situation as well. Yeah. Exactly. Which is cool too. Cause I mean, that's how societies work. That's what we do. We can, you know, yeah. we, we we utilize those those examples. Outside of that, the only thing I would bring up is uh, Trappist is old as dirt. <laughs> he is super super old. He's around forty, maybe a little younger. No, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's the that's the it's that like was ancient. That, yeah, that that was really weird when I, when I read that part of it because you're like, wait, what? Because he gets a look where he's like, actually, I realized he ha- he's probably, and I'm like, this dude's my age. 
because <laughs> yeah. you read him and you're like, this dude is like, he sounds like he's old. Yeah, he's super old. He sounds like he's infirmed, damn near, uh, because of his surroundings, I guess. But listening to the book, the, the, <laughs> these scenes, man, the 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 screaming and the rawr, like all that stuff, yeah. it's, kind of, it's a yeah. little bit, it's a little bit hard, man. It's a little bit hard to listen to. Yeah, I prefer Tarbian's, reading these chapters. <laughs> Tarbian's, uh there's some rough chapters in Tarbian. It doesn't seem like anybody's just fucking crushing it, uh, at least on that side of town. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and when he enters that basement and and the kids are screaming and stuff, I'm listening to it like um, today two times the speed just to brush up on it a little bit faster. And my kid, who's two years old, comes in and he's like cracking up at the sounds that this guy's making and <laughs> <in> fast forward. <laughs> well, it, it's so funny because it's those and then it's hush hush or whatever. What 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 hush hush. What? hush, hush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're very weird. Like the uh, yeah, the audible on on these chapters, it's it's a strange. He's yeah, he's got a, he he makes a few weird noises. Through, I mean, it, the if you've never listened to audible, audible, listen to the audible. It's fucking amazing. Yeah, it is. Like yeah. it's one of the best uh, audible books you'll listen to. But uh, yeah, he's got some he's got some parts where he makes some noises where it's <laughs> it makes me laugh hearing them because it sounds so goofy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 22 right chapter 22 is titled a time for demons in the midst of the midwinter pageantry Kavok decides to try begging in the nice part of town he eventually gets chased off by a guard and then he beats the hell out of him as he tries to make it back to his hideaway he passes out in a snowdrift he's saved from freezing to death by someone dressed as an as in Canis, who gives him a silver talent he both uses the money to get food in a blanket, and he staggers back to his rooftop hiding place near the chimney. Yeah, so kind of the, the the big points then on one, you got the midwinter pageantry, which is basically their sadistic version of Christmas, and it's based off of the story that Trappist tells him in the next chapter. I feel like it's a. It's an interesting mix of Christmas and like a Halloween type element. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, like Krampus, so like a Halloween Christmas. <laughs> Krampus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, you got all the people dressed up as demons, and then you got one guy dressed up as Taylu, and he's going around trying to uh, banish all the demons, and it lasts for I think seven days. Yeah, it is seven days. It's, it's it's a very very weird um, celebration that they have every year, and it sounds like it's uh, extremely dangerous in this particular city. Like especially in the bad part of town, like demons seem to uh, run. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, Christmas plus Halloween plus a purge pg-13 purge yeah, yeah. It, it's very yeah it's really strange when you read uh there's one example where uh a well-dressed couple walking down the street and some dude just comes takes dude's hat throw it in the snow yeah then yeah. is trying to take his walking stick and then the other guy's picking up his girl like roughly picking her up and then she says what you're supposed to say about taylor Te, tehus tehus and tossa eha yeah, which I th- which I think translates to uh, Taylu banish you. Uh, I thought it was something about his dick, okay. but um, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I mean, it's so strange because like, and then the demons run off, right? And then everybody like applauds, and this is the nice part of town. But it's like this is what this is the game you play: is these guys are stealing your shit and coming up and assaulting you. Is the game? Yeah. That's yeah. that's that's the game. That uh yeah, I don't think that's gonna play well uh in our society. No, I'm knocking people <laughs> out. Someone comes flips my hat off my head, they're getting punched in the face. <laughs> so it would be a very it'd be a very violent game. It didn't, I, I would it didn't not, uh, I would not be a big fan. Didn't sound so bad. As a guy knocks his hat off. Woo-hoo. Takes yeah, his girl and shakes her. Shakes no, but her it, well, it's well, yeah, but then Kavoth mar- remarks on that is like, hey, it's very civil in this part of town. 
Well, yeah, because no, that's true. Well, but he, but he, he and, he, and he does also say on the first couple days, especially for whatever. Well, so so he makes the point: the ch- uh, if the church ran it well, they would pay actors to play the demons. Instead, they go the cheap route and sell mass to the public. So then anybody gets to be a demon. Not the cheap route, the profitable route. Okay, well, money off the yeah, shit. yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So and, so, and quote quote uh, explains that when he's a kid, when he was a kid. They would pay his troop, yeah, to be the demons in certain town. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's done more, you know, it's done more tactful, da- more professional, the way it's supposed to be. Apparently, yeah. He talks about his dad would play Incanus, which knowing who Incanus is is uh, it's, it's a it's a disturbing image that yeah. he would play the guy who eventually killed him. He would play an Incanus that would um, that was so realistic that you know people would shudder at the sight of him or however he describes it. And then eventually that's who ends up killing him. Why do you, wait a minute. Why do you think that? Why do you think well, that, the Haliax is in Canis? No, not Haliax, Cinder. Isn't it Cinder? No. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a amalgamation of uh, different people. We'll, we'll go into it more in the next one, but I think it's pretty clear that Haliax is a clear they talk about like he's encased in shadow and stuff like that, but we'll I'll bring it up in the next chapter. I'll make it clear that that's that's who it is. At least that's one of the amalgamations of who he is. One of the people who makes up the amalgamation. Hmm. Okay, I'll wait. For but it. the the big thing I wanted to mention, which I think solidifies who the Watchers were, who I I think this is who gave him the dream. And I think this is what makes it clear is who gave him the, the, the dream that when he was in the woods that gave him the vision of the circle of uh, gray stones and, you know, the necessary stuff to survive and Ben teach him the, uh, the knots. Uh, it talks about, I closed my eyes. I remember the deep silence of the deserted street around me. I was too numb and tired to be properly afraid my delirium, I imagined death in the form of a great bird with wings of fire and shadow. It hovered above, watching patiently, waiting for me. Now, that fits neatly with one of Scarpy's second story. When me he, neatly? When he, neatly, neatly. Oh, you said fits neatly. I was talking, yeah, me? fits neatly with Scarpy's second story. I do? He talks, oh, God. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> With uh, Aleph's uh, angels. So, like, Aleph, in the second story Scarpy tells, he says, uh, Then Aleph spoke their long names, and they were wreathed in a white fire. The fire danced along their wings, and they they became swift. The fire flickered in their eyes, and they saw into the deepest hearts of men. The fire filled their mouths and sang songs of power. Then the fire settled on their foreheads like silver stars, and they became at once righteous and wise and terrible to behold. Then the fire consumed them, and they were gone forever from mortal sight. None but the most powerful can see them, and only then, with great difficulty and at great peril, they mete out justice to the world, and Telu is the greatest of them all. I think the fire danced along their wings, it became swift, it fits neatly with... In my delirium, I imagined death in the form of a great bird with wings of fire and shadow. I think an angel saved him when he's laying there dying. Because, like, they, the guy uh, dressed as in Canis, he's like, I told you there was a kid, kid buried here. So clearly he wasn't easily seen. And mm-hmm. I think that this fiery bird that saved him, I think he was seeing an angel and an angel sent in Canis, the guy dresses in Canis to save him. Garrett, right? I think his name was Garrett. Yeah. Garrick. Hmm. I, so, uh, I thought it was, I was just going to mention one detail that I thought that has always stuck with me is the soothing warmth that he felt as he was dying. Cause he's, he's, he's freezing to death, but well, he's also beat to shit. So he's, you know, he's probably got internal bleeding. He's got all kinds of problems. But I always thought that was really, really interesting that there's a soothing, was, soothing warmth that he's feeling. And then he has, sees these those visuals and everything. Yeah, it was clearly he was dying. He was going to lay there and die. 
Yeah. And then he has a, a vision that resembles an angel comes and saves him. Hey, Dan, where's that, uh, the, the description of the angels? Where's that at again? You said it was Scarpy's That's second? the second story Scarpy tells. Okay, so coming up anyway. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. But the second story Scarpy tells, is it, that's in book one? Yeah, it's right after. It's like the next chapter. It's like it, it might be the n- second chapter after he tells the first story. They're they're right. After oh yeah yeah another. okay. He comes in and like Scarpy's already in the middle of it. Yeah, that's he gets right. There a little late. Oh okay. Yeah, I guess I f- damn. I forgot those details. I I thought that was yeah okay. I I mean to me that's uh that's a very clear description of an angel saying yeah that. yeah I. I this was one of those other situations where as I read through it, I'm like, there's got to be something more to that visual image. You know, the fire, the bird, the shadow. I'm like, there's got to be something more to that. It can't just be, you know, he did research of, you know, near-death experiences and that's what people see because you don't typically hear that, you know. But again, I didn't make the connection. But, you know, from the, what you just described, that seems to be a pretty clear connection. Yeah. And and that makes me think that it's the angels that put the dream in his mind that the angels are looking out for him. So that's like in his his two most desperate hours when he's stuck in the woods and he's by himself. Like he gets a vision of what he needs to survive, and then when he's laying there in his most desperate need, then an angel comes to save him. And, and like you know what they like that one kid says in chapter 20 when he's talking about tay lu he's like you know uh do not call on tay lu saving the greatest need for tay lu judges every thought and deed like they talk about tay lu coming in your greatest need and if laying down in the street beat to shit ready to die in a in a snow drift if that's not your greatest need i don't know what what else would be yeah i mean he'd even like accepted that he was gonna die he was like he was accepting it as comfort is it is it too much of a leap to say that the angels represent or are a representation of the Amir? No, they're different. Uh, the angels were the ones that accepted Aleph's offer. The Scarpy, uh, I mean, Selatos turned down Aleph's offer to become an angel and started the Amir. Because Aleph said, you know, if you become an angel... You can't judge past actions and you can't like, you know, just be on a mission to stop the Chandrian. You're only able to judge the things that you actually see in front of you from here on out. You can't go judge and pass. And he's like, no, nah, that's not good for me. He's like, I want to I want revenge and I want to stop them from doing what they're doing. So some uh, joined uh, Selatos and became the Emir, and some joined Alif and became angels, and then another group of the Ruark uh, went a different route. Oh, you! We need to hurry up and get to other chapters because anybody else who's in my shoes right now is like chomping at the bit, waiting for these other Scarpy stories to play out again because there's so much that I did not even yeah, we're comprehend. Getting- you know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. And we're gonna—I mean, we're getting real close to getting to them. We'll probably get to them next week. But uh, and I'll go into further detail on those. I'll flesh them out a little bit more when we're actually discussing them. But as far as like this stuff goes, that's as as much as you know you would need to know. But I do think that the angels saved him in this spot, and that makes me leads me to believe that the angels are. You know, they they have something in mind for Kavoth. At least they think he's special, that they're protecting him. Yeah, this goes... Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, I, I was going to say, it goes back to that, what I've been talking about, or what I've been trying to talk about, which is that the, the fatefulness, this plan, uh, this overarching plan to pull Kavoth in a certain certain direction, or to make sure that he at least survives and, and can get to this this place, that he serves this role, this purpose... Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, Tim. Um, I was just going to bring it back to what we just read earlier when he went into his dream state and started to learn all this different stuff, that that also could have been, I, again, I can't put it all together, and I don't think any of us can without speculating, but someone being a guide for him and, and nudging him in a certain way and, and giving him information or just flat-out help at certain times when he needs it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it, it, it seems clear that uh, someone's looking out for him just on these last couple tap chapters on seeing, you know, his two most desperate situations. He has a dream. He just happens to have a dream that he remembers everything he's going to need to survive. And then when he's laying on the street dying, it just happens that some dude finds him, not only finds him, gives him a silver talent and literally, literally saves his life. Yeah. Or how about uh, when when they kill his family and then something comes and scares yeah. away the Chandra yeah, right before yeah, he, they exactly. try to kill him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's protecting him, and so someone's got to seize him for a bigger purpose. I think it's pretty fucking clear that that's what's going on. Yeah, it does. It does seem reasonable to make the connection that all these things could be the same body of individuals or maybe the same individual so, something's definitely influ- having an influence here yeah i think it it probably could be you know the angels plus the amir i think you know they seem to kind of be you know they're not a- they don't seem to be adversaries according to scarpy's story it seems like they're you know on the similar wavelength they just have two different ways of you know approaching solving a problem so it could be both of those groups kind of working in tandem with each other. That's kind of the way I've f- felt about it. Like it, it, it does seem like if if it all fits together in the way that it seems, that Scarpy Chronicler they sort of seems- fit. <laughs> that that Scarpy and uh, Chronicler kind of fit into that where they're they're pulling him along, and then he has these extra, uh, you know existential forces um such as whatever influences his dream this angel perhaps yeah it's uh well and and then it all it seems a natural uh connection to make when right after we're coming into these stories of the religion the the mythology that's contained within the world right so that connection seems to be reasonable to to make yeah and uh it's kind of also fucked up that in canis a guy dressed up basically you know the devil the Haley acts the the fucking bastard of the world is the one that saves him yeah it seems super ironic <laughs> well you know, i'm under Taylor and clue. the priests Taylor and the priests are the ones that just kind of roll by him but in canis is the one that stopped and even when he, that girl was like we, you know we gotta leave he's like no this kid's gonna freaking die that's uh that's that's fits his anti-hero that would fit in if Aunt canis is the one saving him then uh who's helping kavoth is helping him to destroy the world he's the anti-hero i mean or, I... or we have a or it could be a uh some symbolism that um uh heliax is not as bad as we yeah fucking think that maybe Haleyax is there's more gray to Haleyax than you know meets the eye. The more we've talked about uh, Haleyax's you know formation, he does seem to be more humanized. I look at him completely differently than I did before we started to talk about it. Well, yeah. didn't we? Isn't isn't one of Scarpy's stories? Uh, isn't Haleyax uh, when he's well? Isn't Land Ray? Who becomes Haleyax? Isn't Land Ray like a great hero? Yes. Yeah. He is. Yes. Which would which would coincide with the way both is right now, uh, or or you know at some point he at least has the possibility, and in the reader's mind, both is going to be this great hero, and then at some point before he becomes Coat at the end, something has changed, and everyone looks at him as this terrible villain that's what i that's that i mean that's what i like so much about the writing is you can view it from both ways you can view it from a variety of different ways obviously but the the idea of the anti-hero is is not to be overlooked it's a possibility you know and that's that's great it's if it was clear one way or the other it wouldn't be (laughs) nearly as interesting to talk about there wouldn't be much to speculate on Right. But it's the fact that we're left trying to make these connections and figure out, you know, what what role it what role is he ultimately playing and which way is he going in or being pulled into? Well, 
the the fact that when chroniclers first trying to get him to tell stories like some say there's a new chandrian that in Kavoth's like well the ones that the ones that know know better it leads you to believe that there's something fishy with him where there's a reason why people would yeah. would view him as a, a new chandri and there's something fucked up that happened that could uh, blur the lines on you know whether he's he's the, a good guy or fucking went bad at least it could be interpreted that i think outside people could interpret what he did to be a villain move but i think there's probably you know more gray to it that he did something bad, but he didn't do it for bad reasons. And it could be that um, just like Landray, he does it for love. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. So. I think that's, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think he's given a very hard decision to make. He makes the decision. He has to live with it. And there's repercussions that he did not intend or he accepted because he had to. Um, and he, I mean, he's bearing the weight of that burden. That's why he's coat. That's part of the reason yeah. why he's coat. He had to do a lot of things, sac- make a lot of sacrifices, it seems. Yeah, I agree. Okay, you guys ready to move on? Actually, to th- there's two things I wanted to mention in the chapter that I just thought were awesome. Um, and we don't even really need to go into it. But it's these those physical details that he used when he's near death, comes out of death. He talks about like the stinging, prickly feeling of his body, how the guy had to like roughly massage him to get his blood circulating again. It's it's great, man. I mean, it's those details where which it takes you through that process of, you know, he's literally trying to stay alive. I, I just I, I think that stuff's great. Like when he walks away and he looks back and he sees one one of his footprints is bloody, and that's like reassuring because well, if he wasn't bleeding, yeah. it would it would have been less yeah, it would have been. Yeah, more you don't disturbing. bleed when you're frozen. I think is what he says. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that was that's that that was great, man. It little stuff like that. Yeah, little stuff like that is so great. But, yeah, it doesn't take yeah, much to impress up. you, Tim. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> yeah, it's written really, uh, really well. Um, yeah. he does a really good job with g- giving you visualizations of what's going on and <laughs> being able to kind of feel it and see it. That's what I was going to say. Beyond visualization visualization you you do feel it it's it's very well done uh was there something those were the two then tim yeah yeah, that's it yeah okay then chapter 23 is titled the burning wheel in this chapter kavoth ends up getting sick and feverish and he heads to trappist's basement to find care trappist begins to nurse him back to health and at one point while he's there tells him the story of minda and canis in the burning wheel guys yeah, I mean, I won't go through the whole story. Obviously, anybody who's read the book is going to go through go through it. But, I mean, it's basically, he tells the story of the winter pageantry. Of It's a very Christian-type story of, like, Jesus, and uh, where Menda is born from the virgin mother, who's Periel, and then Menda goes and starts ridding the world of demons, let's you know, some people come and join him and then he, for you know, the people who join him, he forgives them, kind of sets them on a path to become his disciples well, or priests. And it's important. They get a choice. He gives them the choice. That's yeah. a very important yeah, he gives a, part. Yeah. yeah. And he also I mean, it hit, seemed like a seemed like an obvious choice to me. Except that he hits people in the face with a hammer. <laughs> yeah. But the 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 alternative was to get hit in the uh face with a hammer and get no relief so it seemed like a pretty clear choice to me if i'm gonna get hit in the face with a hammer either way and one gives me relief and one doesn't i'm gonna take the one that gives me relief but you know hey people make stupid choices so <laughs> is that where get then he, is that where getting hammered came from like when you yeah yeah about- yeah okay is came from came from this story <laughs> that that recent <laughs> But then, uh, then he hunts down demons and eventually has to hunt down Incanus and, and, you know, he does what he does. But the kind of the, the pieces we get, because the story, it seems, the story seems like 
an amalgamation of different events and the Incanus seems like uh, an amalgamation of different characters. So the story seems it's in some ways it's very similar to Scarpy's story. There's like these six cities that Incanus destroys save one. Where in Scarpy's story, the Chandrian destroys save seven cities and except for one. One survives. So th- that's there's some s- similarity between that. But Trappist's story, he says it happened, he first says maybe 400 years ago, but then he's like, no, more than that, probably a thousand years, but maybe not quite as much as that. So it sounds like that there's a second event that is very similar to the event that happened in Trappist's story. So it may be that the the Chandrian failed the first time and then they went for a second bite at the apple and tried it again and Taylu forwarded them the second time hmm. is what it kind of sounds like. I don't know if you guys, you know, when, when you go through that, if it sounded like that to you or, or if I'm, if that's just something I picked up. I did not pick up on that, but uh, but that makes sense, seeing as how there's there's a lot of different stories following the same storyline. There's a, there's you know inconsistencies in both. So and and it goes back to what we were, we've said in past episodes, where you know the timelines could be circular, that there could be something going on to that where you know growth is is has been re-entered into another character in some sense i think that i can see it that way uh there is something about the timeline that's that's really interesting i my first reaction to what what dan was saying there is that i've sort of looked at these stories as almost being like different versions of the same story you know how we have different religions you know it's almost like muslims buddhists christians they have different versions of similar stories yeah, Scarpy's story, um, this story, uh, Hespa's story about Ajax stealing the moon, Tellurian's story, uh, they all seem like they're all telling either different versions of the same story or they're telling uh, different parts of the same story, the the same big story, and mm. they're just telling like different sections of this same story. It all seems like that... Um, all these little stories that we get are all filling in the details of of the bigger history of the the world. They all seem to be either telling telling it in a slightly different way or just telling a a, a different uh, part of the story. Yeah. When we get when we get far enough along, I'd like to if you know all three of us can maybe work on it and and give like a side by side synopsis of the four different stories that have been told. And it may not come till we're in chapter in, in the second books, but but do you see what I'm saying? Where we can yeah, line up kind of the similarities. Well, and, yeah, we're definitely. I mean, we're definitely going to dive deep. You know, every time we come across one, like we're, there's there's a ton of stuff I want to talk about in this one to kind of flesh it out. But I think that's it's either a version of Scarpy's story that he's telling, but the fact that he's pretty fucking sure that it's humans and humans didn't exist in Scarpy's story. He, he's pretty sure it's humans, and he's pretty sure it's you know somewhere between 400 and 1,000 years ago. Makes me think that maybe the Chandrian have almost achieved their goal a couple times of, you know, if their goal was to destroy the world, maybe they've almost done that twice. And one time it took Celatos to stop them, or whoever... You know, however, stop that one city from being destroyed. Uh, and this one, maybe Telu came down and, mm-hmm. and put an end to it. But they, it seems like they're telling, you know, a, a very similar story. But a, you know, it's it's kind of like it's they've almost achieved their goal a couple of times, and so they're just constantly trying to do the same thing. And you know, the angels and the Amir and the Scythe are trying to stop them. And they've been successful so far. And perhaps Kavoth is the new Menda. Perhaps. Could be. Uh, although Menda, you know, seems to know who he is. It doesn't seem like he was ever blind to the fact uh, of true. Uh. he was Telu. And 
he became a man in a matter of months. But it also goes back to what his his mom said about um, when when they're in the talking with Abanthe and Abanthe, I guess uh, they're teasing each. I, I'm sorry, Cole's dad is is teasing his mom. And his mom says, well, uh, there was somebody that uh, I met speaking to if 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 Kvothe was actually a god. Yeah. I said, well, there was somebody who I met along the way, but uh, he didn't have red hair. Yeah, but she was talking about him. She was like, he, he bound me, you know, to his will with corded music and corded kisses or something like that. And But he didn't have red hair. She was talking about him. She was talking about Arlen, and she was just kind of being cute. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he's. I don't think Kvothe is a reincarnation of anything. Uh, definitely does not seem to be the same as story of Minda. Minda becomes a seventeen-year-old old, old uh, man a, in three months. Yeah, but if, if if the story is just a a retelling, a retelling that that's gotten you know all these different kind of things where. Because if you think of it, it does line up with Quoth in the way that Kvothe learns everything so fast and, and does grow up really fast. He's not, you know, doesn't grow up in three months, but when he's 16 years old, he's, you know, uh, a hero. And, yeah, he doesn't and, seem to be a vir- born of a virgin mother or anything like that. I don't know. I, I don't see it. I, I was just throwing I don't out see there it. for, yeah. like, loose speculation. But uh, yeah. I think he's part of a, a larger. Uh, again, man, it's a, it's that delicate. It's that it's that interesting uh, way where you can take it from two sides because there seems to be an evil in the world that is being thrust back uh, repeatedly, and there's a good, and there's there's these forces of good that seem to be represented by a Scarpy and a chronicler. And these angels and these stories of, of Telu and these stories of, you know, the, the Selatos and the Amir and yeah, it's, it's connecting all the dots and figuring out where Kavoth fits in. Right. Because that's, he's our vehicle. He's how we where he travel does what through to the me? world. Yeah. What does he do to me? <laughs> Jesus, dude. This <laughs> fucking joke is, it's tired. It's played of out shit. already. It, very much. Well, I was going to say, I mean, a direct connection of the imagery of the story in itself, uh, the the wheel obvious uh, obviously is Kavoth killing the Dracus. That that vision for people that know this story had to be insane, right? I mean, this is part of the reason mm-hmm. why Kavoth is at the upper echelon of stories today, and everyone talks about him because of things like that. I mean, it's they think it's a demon running around all you know fucking uh, crazed on on drugs destroying a town and there's this kid doing what he's doing on a burning tree and you know jumping off of roofs and shit and then this massive wheel and all this fire around slams into him and it's i mean in terms of the uh the imagery it's off a church i mean <laughs> you get much closer to this story yeah you know yeah, I, and clearly, you know, with every, everything he does in that town and even just like the burning the uh, coin on the table and all that kind of shit, he definitely leaves the impression that he is, you know, working through Telu or, you know, he's like a God's messenger type of dude. So, yeah, it, it, you know, obviously we get the truth of the matter, but to them, they're they're seeing some biblical shit happen. We do, though, we get a couple... Um, a couple of interesting things right off the bat in this story. They talk about like horses being lamed, which um, when they talk about it, they're like, but the worst thing in this time was that there were demons walking the land. Some of them were small and troublesome creatures who lamed horses and spoiled milk, but there were many worse than those. Like that makes you think of the scrail. Yeah. And then you had some demons stole the skins of men and wore them like clothes uh, obviously, that makes you think of the skin dancers. So it, it it gives you a picture of a world like what is happening to the world now. Like this is, you know, the world that they live in in this story that he's telling. It seems like this is starting to happen again. 
Yeah, we we talked about that in one of the earlier episodes where we're making that connection where the Skrull's here for a reason. You know, all the all these things are happening, so it's something Kavoth opened up a door somehow, and now demons or what they label as demons are now coming through, and these things have been awakened. So it's something something got triggered. That lackless door. Yeah. Could be. Well, Could yeah, be. I think that's that's what's happened, and um, you also had um, when Taylu he is sending the um, the demons back. It says like Taylu grabbed the demon and broke it in his hands, cursing its name and sending it back to the outer darkness that is the home of its kind. That makes me think he Taylu. In this, in these moments when he's sending these demons back, he's sending them behind the doors of stone. See, but he says that I, I noticed that too. But then, like in the next paragraph, he says he goes around to the different towns and finds the demons and destroys them. I didn't know if outer dark was outer darkness was a, you know, just maybe some kind of portrayal of death, or if if he actually destroys them. Well, the fact that there's Skrail and Skin Dancers coming in the world right now makes me think that uh, he didn't destroy them permanently. He sent them behind the doors of stone. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where, where it lands, but... it. Yeah, it, it seemed like... Yeah, when, when I read that this time through, I remember my feeling was, yeah, there are certain things that are going, going to this area, to this land, um, that we did, we're not familiar with. Others... Other people that have demons in them, they you know they're saved. Basically, it's the demons that are extricated, right, or exercised, however you want to visualize it or talk about it. Um, but yeah, I can't. well, some of them are are just demons wearing human skin. They're not human anymore. Yeah, the human is dead. Well, some like it seems like some are possessed by demons, but some are demons pretending to be humans. Well, that's Encanus, right? I mean, he's one of those. That no, no, that's like the skin dancers. Okay, like that, like they you you couldn't you couldn't remove the skin dancer from that uh, soldier, and he would be fine again. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that that dude's dead. The skin dancer is just wearing his skin. Gross. So that's kind of the difference between possessed versus you're dead and he's just wearing your skin. So I think that's kind of the the difference between those two. But here, all right, Fitz. Here, here's where you you know Incanus is at least a partial description of Haliax. I think I think they describe Incanus as many different people. So I, that's why I say it's an, an amalgamation. Is it says, like, in Canis, the swallowing darkness, no matter where he walked, shadows hit his face. The scorpions that stung him died of the corruption they had touched. So that clearly is, you know, a description of Haliax. The, no matter where he walked, shadows hit his face. Sha- uh, swallowing darkness. It's a very clear description of Haliax. They're going to go through some more... But before we get go into the rest of those, um, just kind of go through some of these things in order. They say about uh, Periel. Now, here's what's interesting is the Talon religion. There are groups that are are uh, menders. There's a part where uh, Lauren asks Kavoth about the the mender heresies, and he's like, "Oh, it was an easy question." Blah blah blah. So they 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 just kind of hint at there's a split between the Talon Church, and you have some people that worship uh, Menda, and they're the the Menders. Mayor Alvaron talks about like when he was searching for the Amir, he found a uh, a Mendery, which an old church, an old Mendery that had uh, old church records. That's where he was searching for the Amir. So there's there's very like little casual mentions of Menderes, Menders, the Mendeher Mender heresies, and so there was clearly there was a split in the church, and so Trappist we have confirmation from Patrick Rothfuss that Trappist is an adherent of the uh, the Mender religion, 
So he's like, he's a disciple of it or a priest of it or a follower of it. You know, one of, one of those where he's following this, uh, he's a heretic basically of the tail. According to the Talons, he's a heretic. But the Mender uh, religion is, it seems to be like kind of a split between either like uh, Catholics and Protestants or um, Christians and and Jews. Whereas like the Menders believe Menda is, you know, God in human form. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is that you got what you guys following me? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm. I, I immediately started thinking like it could be just like Calvinist. I mean, it's just these different sects of religious belief. The smallest difference, they split and they don't agree with them one another. I, I yeah, I see where you're going. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a big, big split, and the reason I bring that up is because uh, Periel, who, according to the Menders, is basically like the the Virgin Mary. But this brings back to when Kavoth sang that that rhyme about the the lackless family and his mom got mad at him. There's a little throwaway line that uh, kind of fills in some details on on this split. It said, "Like I seem to be out of trouble, but I couldn't keep uh, I couldn't keep from asking. How is it any different than parts of uh, for all is waiting?" Like when Fane asked Lady Periel about her hat. I heard I heard it from so many men. I wish to see it for myself and try the fit. It's pretty obvious what he's uh, really talking about. So in this wait, 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 story wait, 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 wait. that... It's, are you going to explain how it's obvious? Because it's not obvious to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is from... This is Kavoth talking. Kavoth's oh. one says pretty obvious. Okay. So Kavoth is... Okay, so here, let me let me step back. So when Kavoth said the poem about his mom and his mom got real mad at him and she talked about the sec- sexual in- innuendo of the poem, he was like, well, how's it any different from for all is waiting? And then he read a verse of from all is waiting. He says, like when Fane asked Lady Periel about her hat and the, in the one of the verses in that story was, I heard it about from so many men. I wish to see it for myself and try the fit. Like he's talking about her hat, where he's obviously talking about that poontang. Yeah, I understand. Um, and so he said, you know, that's where he's saying it's pretty obvious what he's really talking about. So he's 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 talking about that 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 poontang. And he's talking but, about Lady Periel's that 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 line is talking about Lady Periel being correct. Yeah, men. it's okay. basically it's basically implying that Lady Periel is a promiscuous whore rather than being a virgin that yeah yes and so i think that you know you have one group that see her as the virgin mary and then you have another group that's trying to portray her as a you know as a floozy and you know it's clearly she didn't get you know impregnated by taylu by god she was just a stupid whore that you know wanted to make an excuse for why she got pregnant that's how i kind of assume assume the the story is similar to you know people who mock christianity and in the the virgin mary story they're like oh yeah yeah. she you know she got impregnated by god and yeah it's clear she wasn't just uh you know telling joseph yeah that to uh appease him so i think it's similar where you know you got like one group that's belittling belittling her uh explanation for how she got pregnant and others believe it's you know literal that she literally was impregnated by god so I think that's kind of the big split. An example of a mender, though, is Martin, who was with uh, Kavoth and Tempe and Daydan and Hespa. Martin was the tracker when they were hunting the bandits. Martin, when Kavoth is going psycho and, and stabbing the dead body to, to fuck up all those other guys, Martin starts praying and he says, Telu, who was Minda, who you were, Watch over me in Minda's name, Imperial's name, in Ordale's name, and Andin's name. Watch over me. Ordale and Andin are uh, also angels that join uh, Aleph in Scarpy's second story. So, like, he sees Telu as God. He sees Periel as the Virgin Mary. 
and Ordale and Anda are angels working for Telu. So there's a, it just to kind of flesh out the story for you. There's these two warring sides of of this religion. They have different versions of it, and clearly the Talens are the dominant version where the the Menda version, the story that Scarpy's telling, is a heretical story, same as what Scarpy was telling was seem as uh heretical. It's very dangerous. Seems like what he's telling these kids, like this is a very dangerous story to be telling because you're gonna be seen as a heretic if you go out and start telling the story. Well hence also the uh what who 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 arrests them? Uh, priest, right? Or uh, priest of the yeah, church? Taylin yeah, Taylin priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah Taylins. Yeah, interesting. So that's like the that split is the Taylins and the Menders. So wait, so is, wait, so, is one of the big splits. So in the then, world. so Trappist is telling a Menden story, though, correct? Yes, he's a he's a adherent of the that her, her, uh, heretic version of the uh, story. Okay. These are these are very interesting observations because I've always uh, there I mean, without even delving into it and making all the connections you're making, you feel it's there because there's clearly different sects of these religions. You can feel it even if you're not reading in deeply, you know, and the mythology is there because it gets reiter- re- reiterated by multiple stories. And the importance is clear because if their society, it's important to the society, then it's important. And you're living within that society, therefore it has to be, you know, important because you're a member of the society, right? You're living within this. So yes, like Trappist, Trappist telling this uh, story, it's it's viewed from the Talon's per perspective. It makes him a heretic. So like the what what he's telling these kids is a heretical story. Okay, so like this is. Like same way the Talon priest put Scarpy in jail for what he was saying, I think they would throw uh, Trappist in jail if they heard him telling this story. So obviously the the Menders, you know, they're persecuted for their they, beliefs. It's not just that they believe something that the other people, you know, disagree with. They disagree to the point where they will throw you in jail for speaking this this version of events. And so you're taking a big risk telling these stories, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting because that shows in both cases they're underground. I mean, literally, (laughs) Trappist is underground, but Scarpy's also, I mean, he's talking to kids. He's, which is interesting because they're spreading the words to these people, these kids that can then spread the story. Right. And then, but he's doing it in a bar. He's doing it to poor kids, just kids that show up, buy him drinks. Which wow, yeah. If that's religious, that's also pretty, pretty, uh, pretty suspicious, right? Well, yeah, I mean, like Scarpy and Trap is both telling little kids <laughs> stories that can get them in a lot of trouble. Is uh, you know that you know even though like uh, Trap is taking care of uh, you know poor orphans, like you know maybe uh, maybe don't tell them stories that if they repeat it, they're going to get thrown in the, the clink with some priest that seemed to have a problem with touching little boys. Yeah. Maybe not the wisest path to take. Speaking of the, the path, uh, the, the path that Taylor tells people to go on, maybe the right path is not to tell kids these stories, hmm. but whatever, that's what they do. And then, you know, that that's kind of like the, give, gives you a full picture of like the, kind of the not the a full picture but it kind of gives you more of a picture of the break between the religions in this world how how uh tempe and his people what, what what's the name the adem yeah how how do, how do they view how do they fall in largely with religion do we know don't know we don't know what they're okay where they lean is there anybody else doesn't that we seem, know it doesn't seem like they're talens or or Mendez, uh, Martin, we know, uh, just from his thing. And, uh, we know like the Modeg, the, uh, what, what's the, the kind of arrogant little noble guy that's kind of friends with them. Yeah. He's Modegan. Um, drawing a blank on his name. Doesn't matter if you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. This guy 
when he first meets him, like he's missing his rings and um He also knew Denna. Yeah, he dated Denna. That he was dating Denna on a date uh on a date with her when he sang the uh song that got him his talent talent pipes. Uh that guy he talks about like you guys have the like foreign gods or weird gods or some your your gods are all queer or something like that. Like so it it's it seem and some things Willem says it seems like they have different gods. Willem and uh the Modegs don't have the same gods as them. Uh Willem's Sealdish? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's like uh Kilvin, Master Kilvin. Yeah. So it seems like there's different gods in different parts of the world, but like the Talons seem to be like the dominant religion, and then there's a split between the people who view Talu as God. What about the Talons and then the Menders? What about Mer Alvaron? At, at the parts where we see him, I don't, I don't get a sense that he's he's super lit religious. But you know, I'll I'll more to say on that later. There, there's too much to go into on it um right. at this moment but you know possibly later uh when we come across some stuff I'll, I'll talk more about that but right now it just wouldn't wouldn't make any kind of sense but then the oh uh one one of the other things i wanted to mention is kind of the the differences between the orthodox Talon re- religion and the the heretics. You had Martin, who's like Talu, who was Menda, who who you were, like uh, Nina, the girl that gave Kavoth the parchment that had the picture of the Ch- some of the Chandrian on it, and also had one of the the Amir the Seer day on it. She says it seemed the best thing since an angel gave me the dream and they can't lock the church up properly at night since you tore the front off of the building and killed that demon. She reached over and brushed at the paper with a finger. It ain't that hard. All you need to do is take a knife and scrape at it a bit and all the words come off, she pointed. I was careful never to scrape off Taylor's name, though, or Andin's or any of the other angels, she added piously. I looked at it more closely and saw it was true. She'd painted the emir so the words Aiden and Ordal rested directly on top of his shoulders on each side, almost as if almost as if she were hoping the names would weigh him down or trap him. So she like she used uh the their basically their Bible to draw the pictures on and she scraped off the the words with a knife but she left all the names down. And so like that Siri day guy, she had, when she scraped it away, the Siri day guy was painted with Ordal and Andin over both of his shoulders. So it shows you that the Talons also, their religions are very similar where they still see, uh, Ordal and Andin as angels of Talu. The only, it seems like the only big difference is, uh, whether, Periel was a virgin mother or not. Uh, when you say Cyrade guy, is that the Judge Dread dude you're talking yes. about? Yes. Okay. Yes. That was also on the pot, right? Moth and Farm? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm That's sorry. I'm still, she... not, I'm still not certain who that is. The Cyrade? Yeah. The Cyrade were the, the portion of the Amir that had ultimate authority. Like they were judge, yeah, yeah. Like when he goes and he sees Ari, when his hand was all bloody and everything, and she sees him and she's like, "You look like a Siri day," and and then he says something that scares her off, and then when she comes back, uh, he's like, "I'm sorry," and she's like, "No, you're you're my Siri day. You're beyond repro- reproach." So, like, these people were unquestioned. Whatever they said, people assumed that even if they disagreed with it, they would assume that they knew more than they did. They were beyond reproach. So they were, like, judge, jury, executioner uh, in this world as okay. part of the Amir. Okay. All right. So then with that story, when Telu he goes... You know, when he he becomes Menda, 
he's born through Periel as as a, in a virgin birth, and then the townspeople come through, and they start questioning her uh, about her, you know, this kid she just had that he grew to manhood in a matter of months, and they're thinking maybe she slept with a demon, and they're ready to burn her house down, and Minda, who's Telu, steps out, and he's he just lays down the law with these people. He tells them who he is, and he tells them, you can either join me, and you're going to feel pain now, but you're going to be with me from then on, or you can not join me, and you're going to feel pain forever. And so it gives them a choice that seems pretty fucking obvious to me. Pain now for peace later. I'm going to, if if the alternative is pain forever, I'm going to choose pain now and, and peace peace afterwards. But seven of these dumbasses decide not to. The ones that do choose the path, he kind, it kind of seems like he makes them priests. Like he gives... Ringan was the first one, and he's like, now you're Werith, the, the forger of the path. So it seems like he makes priests out of them. And But kind of what's interesting is there were seven that turned him down, and one of them was a demon, wasn't even an actual human, so there were six of them left. The reason that's interesting is Jake, He when they're talking about the Chandrian, Jake mentions that that the first six to chew to turn down Telu to not go on his path, that's who was the Chandrian. But he's one short, right? Yeah, well, it's Haley yeah. X and then the six okay. others. Yeah. And so the reason I find that interesting is because it does mirror the fact that there is, you know, seven demons, you know, six humans that turned him down, and then Haley acts, and Jake also interprets that as they're the Chandrian. It, it's, it's how I would interpret it, just reading the text of the mm-hmm. book, and then there's a character in the book that also interprets it the same way. It seems like he's talking about the Chandrian, the first six that turned down Taylor's past. Yeah, I thought the same thing in this this read-through. I mean, it's an, it's a pretty immediate connection at least in my mind and he, he draws in seven repeatedly he talks about chain they celebrate the chain which is the seventh day you know he talks about you know leading into the eighth day when uh it was the seventh day where finally uh uh what's his face uh caught up to Encanus Telu caught up to Encanus yeah, yeah. yeah and then that's why they yeah. celebrate that day and it's it's there's a lot of repetition yeah, that's of the, the winter seventh. pageantry yeah yeah, yeah. That's why the seven is is uh, such a big term. Uh, you know, it's it's a lucky thing, which is weird because the Chandra entered seven, and so. But yeah, there's 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 a lot of weird things that go with who the bad guys are and who the good guys are. But all right, here here's the part I really wanted to get to. We kind of you know delved enough into the religion. Our fucking hero. The hero of the, the podcast great, is Gray the great <laughs> and almighty, powerful Gray Dalcenti. It's clearly the hero of the uh, story. He's going to come through as like the ultimate uh, surprise hero. Like Kavot's going to be the bad guy. Gray Dalcenti is going to be the true hero of the story. I'm 100 percent confident in that. I think we get a little bit of information on who he is in this. Because I say Encanus is kind of a, an amalgamation of, I think it's an amalgamation of Haliax, the Chandrian, and uh, the Cathay. I think there's parts of the story that that fit very well with all, all of them. So, like, I'll give you an example. So it says, Encanus, whose face was all in shadow. Encanus, whose voice was like a knife in the minds of men. So, the face in shadow... Is clearly Haliax. But whose voice was like a knife in the minds of men, I think that's a possible Gray Dalcenti sign. So you also get that when in Can- wherever Incanus was going, he was killing crops and poisoning wells. So if you remember, you had Cyphus bears the flu blue flame, Sturcus is in thrall of iron, Ferule chill and dark of eye, Usnea lives in nothing but decay. Great Del Centi, superhero, never speaks. 
<laughs> pale alenta brings the blight. So is that so like killing crops, poisoning well? That seems like pale alenta. She brings the blight, or Uznea, you know, nothing but decay as far as you know those two things. But the knife in the minds of men, the driving crazy. The reason I think that that might be the the sign of Grey Del Cinti is it also talks about like uh with Incanus he he felt the chill of Incanus passing and could spy places where he had set his hands and feet for they were marked with cold black frost that sounds like cinder yeah okay and so the you know uh the poisoning well and crops that sounds like Uznea or um Pale Lenta who brings the blight so it sounds like there's they're talking about the different members of the Chandrian but then they they keep talking about like driving people crazy and shit and so there's one part where he's talking to that girl. She talks about, like, she saw... This isn't on one of the parts she drew. This is the first time she meets him. When she comes up to his room, he's like, Hey, anybody who saw anything about the farm, come fucking talk to me. And she comes up to talk to him, and she just tells him one of the parts she sees. This isn't one of the parts she drew. But she says she saw mostly people. There was a woman holding a broken sword and a man next to a dead tree, and another man with a dog biting his leg. So there's many there's many things, like even when he's talking about with Abanthe, he's like, they talk about like animals going crazy. And in this, they talk about, you know, knife in the minds of men, and they talk about uh, setting men to murder one another, stealing children from their beds at night. There's a lot of talk about when the Chandrian around people and animal going crazy and the everybody else has pretty fucking clear signs gray del Cinti doesn't speak but i think he either telepathically drives people and animals crazy or if he does speak he drives them crazy and that's why he doesn't typically speak because he fucking makes everyone crazy who hears his voice which goes along with the Cathay? No, that doesn't go with the Cathay. I'm saying Grey Del Cinti, I think, is not quite the the big frickin' puss that I initially thought he was. I think he might be the guy that drives everybody fucking mad. Because someone in the Chandrian drives animals and people crazy, and the only person who doesn't have a sign that makes any sense is the Grey Del Cinti, and I think it's... Not not just that he never speaks, that he drives these animals and people crazy. There's a word in this chapter that they say, I don't know if it's about the wheel, but they say the word is so horrible that you don't speak it. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, th- yeah, that's, that's talked about. So when I, when I hear stuff like that, th- I mean, that's what I thought of when you're saying, Somebody speaking, you could hear if he has a voice so horrible it drives people insane, or he says things that drives people crazy. I think of like what what it's what the part you're talking about is they're like wrought all of black iron and the wheel stood taller than a man. It had six spokes, each thicker than a hammer's haft, and its rim was a hand span across. It weighed as much as forty men and was cold to the touch. The sound of its name was terrible, and none could speak it. Uh, the, what that reminds me of is a sharp word not for swearing or a word for sworn. Because I think it might fit in with the poem that maybe there's something to do with the name of this wheel that he used might play a part in the poem. Hmm. I also think there's there's a part in here where they talk about when when he there, here it is. Uh, so you shall. Taylu told her and reached out, lay his hand on her heart. When he touched her, she felt like she was a great golden bell that had just rung out its first note. She opened her eyes and knew then that it had been no normal de- dream. So rung like a a ring that can't be worn. Mm. So you get a couple instances in this chapter of a ring that can't be worn. The other one is when he rings the iron will to fuck up in canis when he tries to lie to him so there's a there's a few parts that might be 
play into the poem that Cabot, one of the poems Cabot shared. There's a few times. So we talked about that uh, before where it could be either a bell that's rung or it could be a ring that's not worn. The uh, or it shouldn't be worn. It's interesting because, you know, in the side book, Ari's book, they talk about one of the gears and it's like one of these things where it's like the bell or the wheel it's hit and it rings like a bell. So there's there's multiple times where where that's come in. Yeah. I mean, I think the most likely still is the ring of the gray stones, but there's still like he he writes in enough things that give you doubt on what it could be. It could be so many multiple things because of the way he writes writes the story. There's a lot of rings that can't be worn. Like that's why there's, you know, people have multiple interpretations of it and he, he just so much of what he writes there's multiple interpretations. But the other the other part I wanted to bring in was the uh, the Cathay where I think the Cathay fits in is it was Taylu bent and with great effort lifted one edge of the wheel and set it leaning against a tree that grew nearby. So he pins Ancanus against a tree and he's trapped against this tree. And while he's against this tree, he commanded him to not tell a lie. And he was not able to lie. And oh. that fits perfectly with the, with the Cathay, who's trapped in a tree, and he can't lie. He always tells the truth. So there's the signs mirror the Chandrian. There's clearly many signs that, multiple mentions of signs that, fit with Haliax. There's uh, the tree and the can't lie that fits with the uh, Cathay. That's why I say it's an amalgamation of, of them. And then also when he catches the Incanus in a lie the second time, he goes, Incanus finally was like, my path then I do not regret. If I had my choice again, I would only change how fast I ran. Your people are like cattle my kind feed on. Bite and break you. If you gave me half an hour, I would do such things that these wretched, gawping peasants would go mad with fear. I would drink their children's blood and bathe in women's tears. That sounds like the fucking Cathay. That doesn't sound like Haliax. Especially the bite and break you. Because they talk about like uh, when when um, Kaboth comes back after talking to the Cathay and he comes back to Florian, the first thing she checks is to see if he was bitten. And so that bite and break you she was worried that he's broken bite and break you seems to fit with what uh the cathay does to people and breaks their mind too yeah yeah exactly i i was thinking cinder when i heard uh when i heard that part just because he goes full-on like unrestrained evil which is what cinder is i mean that's that's what he like represents but uh, the Cathay more so like the Cathay if he talks to people his goal is to set them down the worst possible path they can go to he tears butterfly wings apart just out of pure spite and malice like he's he he is and Bass sees him as like the the ultimate bad the most evil fucking person there is that sounds like something the, the, just that I do not regret. If I had my choice again, I would only change how fast I ran. Your people are like cattle, my my kind feet on. That doesn't sound like how Cinder was talking. That sounds like how the Cathay was talking to. Kvothe. So, so if it if he's an amalgam, that what Taylu does to him here is he dissipates the evil, and the evil spreads to multiple. Things. So the way I, I I treat it as is I think that either it's a combination of Scarpy's story of the creation war and like Taylu stop the Cathay or and you know or it is something that happens later where he has to stop the Chandrian and then he he stop you know he he Taylu is the reason the Cathay is stuck in a tree. They, you know, he can't get out, and he's just watched by the this uh, the scythe, and he he can't go anywhere. Like I think it, it might be just telling us how the Cathay got where he got, and uh, maybe like there's a second battle with the Chandrian beyond the Creation Wars. 
So it's kind. Of, it's tough to say because we don't. The story is not real. I was going to say, so it's it's almost like a combination of different events that the story represents, but it's not necessarily tying all the loose ends. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's trying to give us a little bit fuller picture, but it's just doing it in a very, very subtle way. But it does. Like, if you look deep, you learn about the Mender heresies, the difference between the Talons and the Menders... You see the amalgamation of the Chandrian, Haliax, uh, the Cathay. You maybe find out that Talu is the reason that the Cathay is in the tree. You maybe find out that the badass fucking Grey Del Cinti can fucking make people insane. Like So there's little pieces that you can pick up from this story that are super fucking subtle. So along those same lines, I'll throw in, because the last part of the story was, Tayu dies. He 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 burns with Incanus. He burns with him, and and Incanus says to him, "You're gonna you're gonna die just like me." And Tayu says, uh, "Actually, no. Everything goes back to ash. And when I want to, or when I'm needed, I'll come right back." So it's yeah, saying saying if that's a clue that he'll come back, it could go along with what we're saying, where these heroic or anti-heroic characters come back along come back around in the form of a new character or a new person. Yeah. Yeah, he he could come back if needed. And I think he he might have saved Kavot's life when he was laying in the street about to freeze to death. So I think, yeah, I think their imprint is still in the world. And Kavoth obviously talks to gods, he mentions, and possibly kills an angel. And so, yeah, I think there's more to come with Kavoth versus Telu. Before he starts telling his story to Chroniclers when he says that, right? That I'm someone yeah. who's, who's spoken to gods. Well, uh, there's two parts. Like, Kavoth mentions that he's spoken to gods, but Chronicler's the one in his head thinks, you know, this is the man I came to see. This is the man that, you know, tricked a demon to get back his heart's desire and kill an angel fight an angel to keep it this is a this is a man who's you know da 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 this is a man who's killed an angel yeah excellent so the there's a so at the end of uh trappus's story he gets cut off and he says and this is how we know Taylor cares for us watches us and keeps us safe from and that's where it cuts off. Yeah. Is he is he about to say Chandrian? Is Chandrian, maybe the Cathay demons would be my guess. Grey Del Cinti. Yeah. But that's yeah, why he I was, was. going to say that's it. silenced. That's it. Mm-hmm. He was going to say the Grey Del Cinti, but part of the Grey Del Cinti's power is, is when you go to say about him, you're going to get interrupted and you're going to get silenced. <laughs> so his power is being shown right here. Yeah. He made those other kids go mad and start spazzing out, and uh, and that's why he wasn't able to fucking say his name. Probably the reason why my computer crashed when you started to talk about him. Yeah, yeah, it's that powerful. Mm-hmm. Gray Del Cinti, man, he is the man. So now, so now the merch is Silent Man in the back, in gray, straight jacket. I think it's Gray Del Cinti been over laughing as a dog is humping someone's leg. <laughs> that's very, very inside uh, baseball. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a goal. That's, that's gold, Jerry. That's gold. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, well, shit, man. Me? That, that's very interesting to finally get like uh, more about this uh, enigmatic Grey Del Centi. Yeah, yeah, we, that uh, actually uh, makes some sense. Yeah, it it uh, it makes more sense that he's the guy that drives drives animals mad or drives people mad than he's just a socially awkward Chandrian who doesn't talk. <laughs> he's got to have some. Thing more to bring to the table of the fucking Chandrian than I just sit by the side and I don't talk. I hold all my words in. So is there uh, 
Well, I mean, to go down that road, uh, there's the crookery, right? There's guys that delve into sympathy that lose their minds. Yeah. There's, um, I mean, do we have like uh, tangible examples of? I, I mean, I, I get. I mean, you're saying there are examples of people that. And I, you know, he says it in this story. Uh, Trap has talked about in this story of driving men to murder, uh, animals going crazy, th- things of that nature. Yeah, and even uh, Aventy when he was talking to Kavoth's parents, Arladin and and uh, Lorien about the uh, the Cathay. I mean, not the Cathay, the Chandrian. Like one of the signs he mentioned was like animals fucking going crazy. So there's multiple mentions of things going crazy, and this is the first where you're getting, like, you get clear examples of different Chandrian signs, and then there's mm-hmm. just one sign of people and animals going crazy, and the only guy who doesn't have a sign is, you know, the gray Dalsenti, and that would fit that he's the guy that drives them all fucking mad. Which, if you've ever been around, like, someone who's super socially awkward, they kind of fucking drive you a little mad <laughs> like you feel uncomfortable being around them yeah it makes you uncomfortable yeah i think we cracked it yeah cracked that nut mm-hmm. so he's not a lumberjack no a disappointed. Well, he could still be a lumberjack <laughs> maybe he drives lumberjacks crazy enough that they just start chopping down the trees that he wants them to yeah just random yeah. trees uh-huh. yeah he trick he made lumberjacks crazy where they just start chopping trees that would block the road. Yep. It's All hard coming it, together. That that's a hard that's a hard one to make a connection on when not once in the story are lumberjacks mentioned. <laughs> well you know why? Because Gray Del has put the silence on them. <laughs> uh, I uh I think I've covered everything uh in that chapter that i want to want to cover obviously next week we'll get into scarpy stories and then there's definitely more to dive in deep on those this is what i did you, i'm cu- i'm curious if you had a note that said poontang if you had that i didn't particular that was improv that verb that choice, or that improv carry out that poontang. particular I don't even remember I guess it's why, a pronoun. Why, I don't even remember when I brought up Poontang, what it was in reference to. Periel. It was Periel's, Periel's hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Periel Poontang. Let's see if it fits. Yeah. Periel Poontang. And then I think that's the second time you ch- called it more merch. P-Tang. That's more merch. <laughs> <laughs> Periel Poontang, man. That shirt, that, merch is just flying out of the show every episode. <laughs> Jesus. All right, well, let's wrap it up then, because... Uh, People are looking forward to hearing Scarpy's stories, I'm sure, and having us get into them. All right. I know I am. So have, right, have a good one, guys. We'll talk to you next week. See you. Yep.